<laughs> Let's talk about the body. Can we talk? Because you mentioned that this was almost your best worst. And I think that was true for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> they are rough with this body. They are, you hired movers that you found on a telephone pole with this body. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's not helping that this house has the spiral staircase from a medieval castle. Yeah, right, exactly. the only exactly. access point to right, the upper no, floor. The stairs are like you're worried about like making sure that your enemy has to attack right-handed against the wall or some <laughs> shit. You know. God awful... Movie, movie, movie. Welcome back to the Gamecast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema because otherwise I'd have it too easy. I'm your host, No Illusions. Heath is off this week, but sitting 900 miles to my northeast is my bad friend, Eli Bosnick. Eli. How are you this fine afternoon, sir? Incredible, Noah. I am incredible. This is one of the what are the real peaks for our show? It really is. Okay. <laughs> but before we get to that, I have another masochist to introduce here. Sitting 4,000 miles to my east northeast is my metrically bad friend, Michael Marshall Marsh. Welcome back, sir. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. Uh, you can't tell, but I just arrived into this podcast on a horse. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so that all makes sense. That's all yeah, actually. I'm sure that'll factor into the podcast in some <laughs> way at some future point. Yeah. So tell us, Marsh, what will we be breaking down today? Oh, so we watched 70 times seven. It's the story of a young Christian rancher slash businessman whose pregnant wife is unexpectedly murdered and how hunting her killer brings him back to God. And it's sort of like if Jack Chick wrote John Wick. Yeah. That's what this film is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're wondering, by the way, listener, why it's called 70 times seven, that's the runtime in minutes. <laughs> <laughs> in years, if you're yeah, experiencing right. it. <laughs> exactly. How many years of my life it subtracted? And Eli, how bad was this movie? Well, if you love Christian cinema, but you've been waiting for every weary trope, every badly aimed camera and every ill positioned microphone to come together in one extraordinary film. <laughs> you <laughs> will love this movie. I'm going to make a bold claim. I think this might be the worst movie we've ever had to watch. Really? Definitely top five. Mm. Definitely top five. Okay, so here's the thing. If you can divide somehow like quality units by production dollars, then yes, right? Like I think you're, you're right. Like, like of all the movies we've watched where the credits all have like different last names, you know, and they have like location <laughs> manager and boom operator, like this, it, for something like that, like, yeah, it may be the worst we've ever seen. It was spectacularly bad. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible. Absolutely incredible. Something that comes up a lot when I tell people about this job that we do is they'll be like, yeah, but like, isn't it ironic? Like, oh, you mean like, a, you know, like a turkey killer or whatever, you know, that one that was like ironic that we watched mm -hmm. the Halloween one or those ones where people make bad movies on purpose. Velocibaster. Yeah, yeah. Right. Where it's like very tongue in cheek. Right. And you, you have to explain to people that these people are trying as hard as they can. They really as are. Absolutely hard as they can. And they fit. And it's beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> right? The way some people look at the pyramids in awe and wonder, I look at this movie. <laughs> it must be aliens. It has to be aliens. <laughs> so is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? Yes, yes. I want to say best worst focus on the camera, <laughs> oh. the lens focus. There were times that it was so blurry. I had to keep genuinely checking. I, I wasn't slipping out of consciousness. <laughs> and it was the picture that was blurry and not my eyes. Like I had to keep staring at things outside of the screen to make sure that my laser eye surgery hadn't spontaneously undone during the course of this film. It was yeah. that, that out of focus. <laughs> oh, there were so many good best worst choices on this one. I almost went with best worst corpse removal. Right. Because that was <laughs> oh, that was pretty great. But I I'm ultimately I'm just going to go right to the heart of the thing. Best worst who done it. Sure. Right? The, the mm. killer's name might as well be Suspect McKillerson or something. <laughs> like it's, it could not be more obvious. And then the whole movie is like, maybe it was this guy. It's like, no, it was obviously that guy. <laughs> At one point, the movie wants you to suspect a literal child. Yes. Rather yes. Than the person who did it. Have you ever to been told a riddle? 
by a child and you have to pretend <laughs> that they're like, what's a bird that flies in the air and is called a chicken? And you have to be like, mm, <laughs> that's a tough one. That's how this movie, that's the construction in this film. Oh, shit. And again, I'm going to take the easy one. I feel like I always go for the easy one. I'm going to go with best, worst, least appropriate guitar performances. Oh, God. To be clear. Yes. This is supposed to be a vengeance thriller. Vengeance yep. thriller about the murder of a man's wife and unborn child. It contains five guitar performances. <laughs> five. Five acoustic guitar performances. And every one of them is so weird. Every one of them is so ill-timed and inappropriate. It's incredible. Yeah, if this movie was called an acoustic guitar concert, five <laughs> guitar performances <laughs> might be a little much for me. <laughs> well, what's amazing, too, is that it's all the same guy and he's the director, right? So, like, yes. he was like, he was like, mm, I think they're going to want me to play the guitar again. I, I Honestly, I think that's what the audience is going to need right now. Yeah, I need the character to come up and tell me how much they need to hear me play guitar. Yes. So that happens multiple times in this oh, film. He paid people to t to ask him to play <laughs> guitar for them. It's amazing. So, all right, well, as we've revealed, this one's a mystery. So we're going to give everybody a minute to put on their thinking cap. But we'll be back in a hurry with all the perfunctory dialogue of 70 times 7. Okay, well, w uh, what if I need to call Suzanne? Oh, it's easy. So Charlie down the pub talks to Carol, who works with Suzanne. That's that's crazy. Hey, guys, what you up to? Hey, Eli, did you know that they don't use phones in Liverpool? They don't? Nope. So everyone is never more than one step away from the person they're in the room with. So you just ask. So lucky, right? No, no dropped calls, no surprise fees. Well, Noah, I don't have to deal with those even in America because I've got Mint Mobile. What's Mint Mobile? Mint Mobile lets you order and activate from home with eSIM while saving tons of money on phone plans starting at just $15 a month. 15 bucks a month? That sounds amazing. But it gets better. This holiday season, the best deal in wireless can be found at Mint Mobile. Right now, when you switch to Mint Mobile and buy any three-month plan, you'll get another three months for free. All plans come with unlimited talk and text and high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and switch easily and effortlessly with eSIM. That's incredible. It really is. I switched to Mint Mobile when they became a sponsor, and I've got the exact same service, but I've saved a ton of money while doing it, even when I was in England. For a limited time, buy any three-month Mint Mobile plan to get three more months free by going to mintmobile.com slash gam. That's mintmobile.com slash gam. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash gam. Well, all right, Marsh. Looks like I'm going to be going with Mint Mobile after all. Oh, Miss Wooson's going to be so disappointed. Why is that? Well, it was going to be her chance to finally shoot up the chimney and see her sister again. England is weird. Yeah, well, at least we have healthcare. Okay, and then on your first day, you're going to want to go up to the biggest guy there, like the biggest one you can find, and you're just going to be like, hey, do you have beliefs that need re-examining? Right, yep, good thinking. Yes, yes. Hey, fellas, what you doing? Oh, hey, Noah, I, I was just getting Marsh ready for vulgarity for charity. What's Vulgarity for Charity? It's our annual charity fundraiser for ModestNeeds.org, a tax-exempt charity that helps keep people who aren't eligible for other kinds of assistance from slipping into poverty. Oh, yeah? And how do we do that? Well, listeners to our podcast can go to ModestNeeds.org, donate $50 or more to anyone who needs help or to the general fund, and then send proof, along with who they'd like us to roast, to vulgarity for charity at gmail.com. We'll be choosing 100 random folks, and our top 100 donors get their roast read live on air. Plus, we'll have special guests like Thomas and Andrew, Marsh, of course, Kara, and maybe even a surprise or two. Well, that sounds awesome. But, uh, but uh, what are the orange jumpsuits for? Oh, right. No, with the uh, British slander laws the way they are, you just you can't be too careful. Oh, right. Yep. Yeah, we were thinking he could be the prison skeptic. Oh, yeah, no, that sounds great. Ross. <laughs> and we're back for the breakdown and we're going to open up on the harbinger of quality that is the Bridgestone Media Group logo <laughs> we all knew we were in for a treat as soon as we saw it and so, and then we get these opening credits with, with a bunch of horses this movie is not about horses by the way that have a very like 
I do too know what all the buttons on the camera do feel to them. <laughs> yeah. If you're wondering how bad this movie's going to be, this film has not been formatted to fit your screen because <laughs> both the Bridgestone logo and the opening credits are literally cut off at the edges. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and this is the first time that I got a hint of how badly focused this was. Because this whole opening shot of them on horses coming over the horizon kind of thing is so out of focus. It looks like they photoshopped out the sky. Yeah. It looks like it's like, oh, it's too grey a day. So we've just photoshopped that out and, and covered it in post. Yeah, put a paint chip in there behind it or something. Yeah, there's also this amazing moment. So, so we're meeting this couple, David and Jacqueline. They're on horseback. We see them on horseback at first, but like she's getting a little too bouncy for a Christian movie <laughs> right so we cut that real short and we get this amazing opening dialogue the dialogue will not get better from here folks these are the actual opening lines i love you just so much i love you more i hope it's always like this <laughs> yeah i mean like, look present company excluded but i feel like when you marry your high school sweetheart this is the kind of dialogue you write for your romance movie. <laughs> Check one box for I love you. Check two boxes for I extra love you. And this, I think, was the first time I tried to Google this film to see if I could find anything out about these actors. And what I'd find throughout this, every time I'd try and Google anything, was that Google, because of the title of it, 70 times 7, Google just kept defaulting me to the calculator right. every single time. So it'd be like, 70 times 7, it'd be like, come on, man, it's 490. We've been through this. So no, Google, I want information. And by the way, if you got that by multiplying 7 by 7 and then adding the zero back, congratulations, you did new math. Shut up about Common Core. God. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> also, that guy who makes coffee is Josh Forstein, and you're yeah, sharing right, a video yep, of Josh yep, yep. Forstein. You should, just you so should you know, probably know that. You're yep, sharing Josh Forstein. You and Josh Forstein agree on anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So then we, we cut to that lovely fountain that the Rotary Club got installed downtown, right? <laughs> <laughs> we see this fountain so damn many times. Never, it never factors into any damn thing. But this is David going to work. He has to pass this fountain. We see him getting in an elevator, but like clearly there's no building in that town that has an elevator. Give me a fucking break. No. You know, if there's an elder, if there's a fucking elevator, it's for elderly and disabled people. OK, <laughs> walk up the stairs, you lazy bastard. But we get David going to work past the fountain. And as he steps in, he gets a call from Jacqueline. They have some more great dialogue. Yeah, she calls him to tell him that mountains are beautiful, which uh, was a, an absolutely essential call to make as the man is heading into work. Yes. <laughs> In case you forgot. And then we meet the secretary here. Now, the secretary has a crush on David, the main character. Um, and is therefore a suspect. Bum, bum, bum. Yeah, right, right. I honestly, I don't know if they were trying to go for suspect here or if this actor slash director was like, now she would probably have a crush on me, right? Because I'm so hot and play guitar. For the realism. Oh, because he was a director. That's yeah. what, because it made no sense otherwise. Because at no point did the secretary like try and make a move on him mm -hmm. or do anything at all other than like hand some papers and things. So I thought, why are they adding this subplot of her clearly being into him? But you're right, it's because he's the director. Yeah. So you just assume <laughs> that everybody wants to fuck him. Yep. Incredible. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so he goes to meet with his boss, who is also his dad. This is also one of the points where, because we're focusing on the, on the, the actors' faces, all of the background is terribly out of shot. And it looked for a moment like one of the pot plants had requested anonymity. It was that <laughs> out of focus in the background. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so he goes to meet with boss dad, and they have some business conversation that basically boils down to, so you're getting married soon, like just a couple of scenes from now. <laughs> Oh my, they're vamping. I almost went with best worst vamping about business because mm. he literally just hands him paper and he's like, remember, you'll need to sign those. He's like, yep, I'll get them to you by the end of the day because they know that I'll get them to you is by the end of the day is business words and not, no, you just, I said sign them. It was taking <laughs> like literally seconds. Just, just take a pen and move your hands, please. And I'm not, I promise you, I'm not going to keep harping on about this. This was kind of, this is where my notes kind of finished on this one aspect. But because 
this shot with his dad is seemingly shot three inches from his dad's face. <laughs> yes. This is where I had a realisation that the reason everything else is weirdly fo- like out of focus in the background is I think the camera lens, the focus just got stuck. The dial <laughs> focusing got stuck and they just have to work with whatever it could achieve. <laughs> just keep moving the camera back and forth until it was just got, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's all we could do. Damn it, Bill. Like a magnifying glass. Were you making brownies before you operated the camera again? <laughs> yeah, the brownies. <laughs> So yeah, so he goes to leave. And by the way, so on his way into the office, the phone call with his wife, the way back out, three different times he is reminded that his dad's birthday party is on Friday. Right? <laughs> yeah. And it's like once by his girlfriend and I think twice by the reception. So well, if this guy, mm-hmm. this guy has a type when it comes to women and that type is the type who'd remind me about my dad's birthday. It's, <laughs> it's a niche. That it's, he got lucky to find two, to be honest. Yeah, Very right? specific results on many vids, yeah. <laughs> but, and obviously this meant, this, is, this seems like classic film foreshadowing. He's obviously going to forget his dad's birthday. Nope. No. Nope. He's there. Mm-mm. When nope. it comes, nope. he's there. That's, just, that, that's because this movie trusts his audience so little that later when we're in a birthday party where his dad is saying, thank you for coming, they're afraid that the audience would go like, well, where the fuck are we now? This isn't the home <laughs> or the work. <laughs> so, okay. Then we get this ominous dream sequence. It took me so fucking long to figure out how much of this was supposed to have been a dream sequence. <laughs> but he shows up in this grave where there's a, a beheaded My Little Pony. Yep sitting on top of it. Mm-hmm. That's a call forward back, which yes. usually, usually you need to be me in a podcast feud to write a call <laughs> forward back. Uh, but don't worry, this movie will do it. So look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spoil something just ever so slightly for our audience here, okay? That My Little Pony doll is a callback to a flashback that we will have at the end of the movie. Now, where it belongs in the movie is here-ish. Right. They'll just never do that flashback. So it will make absolutely no sense until seven seconds before the credits roll. <laughs> <laughs> and even then, not really. Yeah. So we get that. Then we get him alone on a horse-drawn carriage. And ladies and gentlemen, this this actor is not very good. He He fails in a lot of things. But one real titan of acting moment that he manages here is that he he looks harumphy on a horse-drawn carriage. It's true. Right? That <laughs> yeah. is hard to fucking do. He looks so sad. <laughs> but then, so he wakes up, right? He wakes up at 4 a.m. after having this nightmare and calls his girlfriend to make sure that the nightmare was not, like, prophetic. Yeah. And that she wasn't <laughs> dead and somebody hadn't pulled the head off of her My Little Pony. Which is crazy for a couple of reasons. One, because it turns out it will be precisely prophetic, like weirdly prophetic in a way that makes you question the supernatural events of the later end of this film, like whether there's something supernatural going on because he's bang on as to where we're going with this film. But the other thing is, like my wife and I lived apart for like the first eight years of our relationship. We lived in separate cities. And if I called her and woke her up at 4am because I'd had a bad dream, I guarantee you she would have ditched me by now because that is not a good (laughs) thing to do to the person you love. Well, I do this to Heath two or three times a week. So now I feel weird. <laughs> and he's not on the shore right now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I, I honestly, I, I, I saw that scene and I wrote in my notes. I'm like, I guess that's one of the advantages of being skeptics that we just forget about. Right. You know, like nobody would call us and be like, I had a prophetic dream. And I think we, that you were hurt. Are you OK? Some of our moms still carry those beliefs. No. <laughs> <laughs> But this is, again, this is testament to how badly made a piece of cinema this is, because as he's doing this, waking up from the prophetic dream, he lifts his hand to check what time it is, and there's a massive shadow cast on his face, which means he's been sleeping in the rays of a bright blue light. The entire time. No wonder you're not sleeping at 4 a.m. You've got, right. like, the world's strongest light focused on you, like you're trying to be waterboarded by the CIA or something at the moment. <laughs> so, so, okay, so then we cut to... David and his best friend, this this character's name is Braden, by the way. They will not reveal that until late in Act 3, but David and Braden are going to karate prayer practice. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys, real quick, before we shoot this scene of us doing karate practice, do either of you know, and I can't emphasize this enough, any fucking karate? No? <laughs> Perfect. Action, everybody. Let's just yes. fake it. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, we know one person who can do Taekwondo and, and you're reasonably well. They're reasonably good at it. And so we'll just do like 
a split second bit of footage of them before we don white gloves and just grapple with each other, which is what they end up doing, which is yeah. not karate, taekwondo or, or anything, I don't think. I'll tell you what, it's definitely not taekwondo. It's no. a bunch of things, but taekwondo, it's definitely not. Well, what's amazing is that very clearly this was a case of like this girl and the guy that she's sparring with we're like, okay, you can use our dojo, but you have to show us kicking some ass in the movie, doing our badass high kicks and stuff. And they're like, yeah, no, no, we can, we can work that out. Yeah, and I guarantee that happens throughout the film. There's plenty of other examples of like this. See, this location would only let us shoot if we were able to use it as a promotional video for this location. Yes, right. like, I've got them in my notes. We'll come to them. Yep. We'll come to them. <laughs> we'll come to several of them. So we get like three seconds of these two hugging at the karate dojo. And then we cut away. We're going to dad's super fancy rich guy birthday party or what these Ooh. guys think is a rich guy birthday party. Yeah, we're talking double tree, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Candles in jars. Ooh la la. Yeah, there's a, a piano player there doing jazz on basically a Casio keyboard. That's <laughs> yep. what he's using. God, what, as, as they're walking in, the wife, Jacqueline, says, only 50. He looks so young. It, that's Those two clauses are going in different directions. What are they doing in the same sentence? <laughs> and, and, then, and then she says, you know, he looks that young because of God. Yeah. And, and to his credit, David just ignores her saying that. He doesn't say anything <laughs> back to it. He doesn't react. It's like, yeah, that's fair. That is a psychotic thing to say. We'll just leave that one there. Flash cut to God standing by dad as he goes to bed. Dude, you got to use an eye cream before bed. You got to <laughs> use an eye cream before bed. A little bit every day. It's also where we find out that dad, his wife has died. So David's mom's died. And David says, you know, he had to pray so much to get rid of his loneliness which is meant to be inspirational, but like, so God ignored pretty much all of his prayers except the last one then. <laughs> all, those, all those previous times, he just like, no, no, I, I don't think you've prayed enough over your dead wife yet. So we're going to leave you hanging. Well, it's, and it's not like he's got a girlfriend now or anything either, right? He's still alone. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, he just doesn't care anymore. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. And there's also this great moment. So so Braden, when he's not karate wrestling with, with David, every scene in the first act of this movie will be him brooding over the fact that he loves Jacqueline, loves David's girlfriend, and she doesn't love him back. Murder, murder, mm -hmm. murder. Right. He's just basically murder. standing in the corner of the room going, murder, murder, murder. And a lady walks up to him and she's like, oh, I haven't seen you in church lately. He's like, yeah, I've just been mumbling murder, murder, murder under my breath in this corner the whole time. He's he's mumbling how much he wants to fuck Jacqueline yes. as a stranger walks up. Yes. He's, he's, he wants to fuck her so much that he's happy to say to her to relative strangers, apparently. Yeah. So, okay. So we get that real quick. And then the terrible Christian singer that's on stage wraps up. Guys, guys, do Christian people hire like faith singers for parties and shit? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, the, the best part of, one of the best parts of this job is that we get exposed to these tiny, horrifying slice of life moments of religious Christians. And I cannot think of anything worse than, and of course, we have to book a nice faith-based singer for your birthday. Oh, as a yeah. fun. If you did that to me as a prank, I'd be like, ah, it's a little too far. <laughs> like, oh, man. So I, I can't, honestly, that. I couldn't, <laughs> When I saw that in your notes, I was like, okay, is he going to suggest that we hire one of these people for one of our events, or is he going to suggest that we pretend to be these people for someone else's events? I'm in either way. Yes! I think you could hire Fuck. not just one of these people. I, I think you could hire this person. I think you could hire the one <laughs> yeah. in this film for right. one of your events. God, if you could open the next Gam Live somewhere in the US with this faith singer. Yes. I mean, look, they take it. They take the booking. They don't get a lot of bookings. They take that booking. I'm not the one with the company card, but the answer is yes. <laughs> this woman is hired tomorrow if the boss says yes. So well, but, but Noah, you actually have an even more brilliant idea. We list ourselves as faith singers. We do the first song totally straight. Then there's some choreographed shenanigans like the mic breaks. And we just forget, like we, we lose our religion in front of the audience every night. <laughs> As the act, like we get you know, a if Jesus was really on our side, would he break our fucking microphones? What's that? <laughs> a car crash, you say? Why, God, why? <laughs> I'm starting to wonder if you're even there. <laughs> Silver bells. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so, okay, so she wraps up her song. 
dad comes up, you know, thanks everybody for being here. And he's like, and you know what we can all really use right now is a guitar performance from my son slash the director of this film, David. <laughs> Are you allowed to just make people <laughs> sing you a song on your birthday? Because I'm 100% doing this to Heath if you are. <laughs> <laughs> and now to play the maracas for us, Heath and right, everybody, get on up here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this is, by the way, this is, like whatever the next step up from hold on a second guitar playing is called, whatever that is, that's what David is doing at us, right? Oh, 100%, 100%. Then his singing as well. His singing is just unintelligible syllables. Yeah. It's incredible. He's just like, Nazarene, okay, more of that, please, David. That was so close. I'm worried we're going to have to get the rights to that song. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah, if I had gone for like 15 more seconds, we could have been DCMA on this podcast. Marsh, Marsh, don't turn around. Toby Keith is right behind you. (laughs) Right behind you. Just hold very still and Toby Keith will go away. (laughs) Oh, God. And while he's doing this, they go over to his wife and, and, and somebody's like, oh, I really like your key necklace. Is it going to have any symbolic importance in, in the movie? And she's like, shockingly, no. <laughs> no. But <laughs> ugly jewelry, Christian movie bingo. Check. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The fact that they focus on this key so much made me think this this is 100% the key that unlocks David's chastity cage. That is what <laughs> that key that he gave on a necklace around her neck for Christmas Takes is. Takes the bear there's trap a, off, yeah. There's a whole thing going on there. But the person who asked this, this is David's brother, who I think looks like sales exec Satan in this scene. Okay. It's his girlfriend. And the way his girlfriend speaks... She talks so stiltedly that I'm pretty sure she's being played by that AI that that one guy thought was sentient. Because all she does is just reflect back anything you say. She reflects back with a question about the wedding. How is the wedding going? Oh, it's going great. Is it going great? I'm glad you think it's going great. It's just, it's not AI. It 100% is. All right. So I, I can't imagine mistaking her for sentient, but okay. All right. <laughs> this pretty dumb guy. So, okay. So then we, we we get this fucking scene. I This is not even worth mentioning, but it's so fucking funny because it's supposed to be a montage of David and Jacqueline in the park having fun, but they're not in a park, right? They're clearly in that like liminal green space outside of a hospital or something. Yes. And the idea of like a whole thing, it's like, it's like spending all day together on a traffic island, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just cars whipping around them in the background. Yes. <laughs> Having a little picnic. And they're, they're just trying to find interesting things to do in this really boring space. Like they walk up to a tree and they examine its leaves like they've never encountered a tree before. Right, they seem genuinely must be one curious. Of those earth trees we've heard so much about. It is by far the most boring time anyone has ever spent outside. <laughs> All that's missing is like someone's sweet aunt to like pop onto screen and be like, you see, there's plenty to do in Bohoke in Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like a real estate tour of a very large house? Yeah, later? right, right. We can't give this fucking thing away. <laughs> so, okay. So, but this montage resolves with them at church. The pastor is explaining this movie's title, right? You know, Jesus said, no, don't forgive him seven times. Forgive him 70 times, seven times. <laughs> and that's, that's a very nice sentiment. But it's also just a very concrete number for God to issue to the people of the world. Yeah, for you, like, after your first 490, you're off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> right, because like, here's the problem. Like, if I say that, someone's like, oh, nice. I like that sentiment. But if the creator of the universe said that, it kind of becomes a rule, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, you've got to keep a tally on everyone. The, a countdown timer of sorts forms. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So we wrap up church and then we cut to David and Brayden playing some basketball together. Murder, right? murder, 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 murder. This might be one of the, the first times we, we see a recurring theme in this movie, which is somebody, usually David, arriving at a scene in a car, which is 90% of this film it is really cars is. arriving at places. This time it's it's Brayden arriving somewhere and he, he pulls up and immediately gets out and they start playing basketball like four inches from his fairly expensive looking car. Yeah. And I, I really wanted someone to just like trip over his car as they were going for a jump shot or something. <laughs> so- He's like, hey, Brayden, why aren't why weren't you in church in that last scene? And Brayden's like, because I'm an atheist murderer. <laughs> Duh. Murder, murder, murder. Obviously. Murder. Sorry, are you just constantly mumbling murder under your breath? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, you want to play some basketball. And then, okay, so then we get this bizarre scene where Brayden, David, and Jacqueline are out horsing together. David gets ahead of them. And the very first line spoken in this scene is, 
Is Jacqueline responding to a line that must have been edited out because Brayden didn't say it? Yeah, and, and presumably then the line was, I'm going to murder you later in this film. And they <laughs> it out oh, that, that might be too obvious at that point. <laughs> yeah, no, she's, the, the scene starts with her going, oh, you know, I don't know. I, I guess I feel a little sick, honestly. <laughs> and he goes, just for the record, I knew you before you fell in love with David in case that comes up later in like a motive kind of way. Jacqueline, Jacqueline, how do you feel about the principle of dibs? Um, <laughs> would you want to marry a man who just ignores dibs? <laughs> Looking out for you. <laughs> also, we have to talk about this. Jacqueline is wearing the craziest wig possible. Yes. Oh, right? yes. Like, mm -hmm. it, it seems like she's in police custody from a, a kindergarten production of Who's Afraid of Virginia Wolf. It is <laughs> baffling. So, yeah, so we get that scene. Then we get to them, uh, Brayden and David, karateing together again. With, I will point out, the exact same shot of their friends who know actual karate, but from a different angle. Like, they just reversed the shot, so it's their, her doing that spinning <laughs> kick yes. again. Yeah, she's perfected a 360, and she's going to show it off at every available opportunity. If they're going to put this in the advert for their dojo, that's going to go up on local television immediately after this filming is done. Yeah, yeah. right. So there's this great moment, too, where they're like, this, one of these Christians being too honest moments where David's like, what's wrong with you, Brayden? He's like, oh, I don't know. I got a lot of stuff on, his, on my mind. And David's like, no, well, yeah, but the key here is to stop thinking. <laughs> that's literally what he says. I'm like, wow, they're more honest than usual in this movie. Yeah. I think this director is capable of stop thinking. I think thousands of years of Buddhist theory really come to fruition in this director. I think if we could get a CAT scan on this dude, we'd find that he has this ability quite easily. <laughs> yeah. And it's a really weird detail, but Braden at this point is wearing a Man United top, which is such a weird detail, but then he's a super entitled guy living on past memories of happiness that he now feels he's got some sort of divine right to. So it completely <laughs> tracks. Completely <laughs> tracks. So, Zing. Have that. Then, okay. Then we get one of the weirdest scenes of all time in any movie. David is driving home and this movie is like, you know, we haven't really come up with a plot yet. Maybe it's an espionage movie. <laughs> and then he notices that there's a mysterious man following behind him who then pulls up alongside him and shoots at him several times. Yes. No, they don't have glass breaking money. So the bullets go in the open <laughs> driver's side window and out the open passenger <laughs> side window and don't hit anything. Apparently. Yeah. <laughs> also, can I just throw this out there? Pretty odd to use the only person of color that will be in this <laughs> yes! film yes. as the drive-by <laughs> shooter. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And I really want them to never explain that scene. And I so almost got my wish. You yes, really did. Right at the finish line, <laughs> they, they explain it in the most throwaway way. Oh, so late that I had to change my best worst in my notes. Yeah, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> absolutely. 100%. <laughs> so, okay. And then we cut to, a, I wrote my notes, like we cut to a church so they can pray for a plot. But no, apparently this is for the wedding. And that David and Jacqueline at their wedding are doing some sort of weird sensual communion eating scene. Yes, thank you. Where they're you. like feeding each other communion. It's I so strange. I don't think you're supposed to do an arm hook, arm cross toast with the blood of Christ. I don't, <laughs> look, I'm not here to tell people how to do communion, yeah. but I'm pretty sure they're like, I drink from your goblet and you drink from mine. It's not In champagne meant. flutes. Yeah. They're using yes. champagne flutes for the blood of Christ. I yes. feel, <laughs> feel like that's not in the spirit, if you know what I'm saying. Also, what religion are these people? Yes. Because thank you. there is very clearly a menorah in the background and I genuinely had to Google, D did Jews do the Eucharist? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they're just vindictive about it. Now I'm eating that. <laughs> Any excuse for a snack, right? <laughs> a little nosh, little savior. Yeah, no, there's very clearly a menorah there the whole time. Weirding me the fuck out. So anyway, so we get the wedding. She throws the bouquet. Brayden catches it, but, you know, harumphily. You might as well strangle the bouquet. Just like, murder, murder, murder. <laughs> Then David sings another song yes. at his own wedding, yes. like four inches from his bride. He picks up a guitar and sings at her in front of the congregation. What a prick. What a <laughs> prick. <laughs> and then, okay, and then the two of them leave on that same horse-drawn carriage from his dream, 
right? Yes. Oh, God. And I really, because it's the same road, I really wanted there to be another drive-by from the shooter, but he's like <laughs> driving at like a black horse and carriage sort of galloping around his head and shooting at them. <laughs> yeah. She says, they're in the horse and carriage. She says, this is like a dream. And I wrote, Taking a horse and carriage down a Kentucky interstate is a dream? Yeah. I mean, it, it is like a dream. It's specifically like his dream. Right. Like the dream <laughs> you've seen him have. This is like your dream. Here, here are my notes in order. This is like a dream. We will never die. We will never die. We will never die. They chant louder and louder. Soon my screen is black and their shouting blows out my speakers. <laughs> never ending possible is back at all. Because <laughs> I was watching it on Tubi and that's yeah, the end. Yeah, yeah there you get some ads here and there. When she says that thing about the dream, she does deliver all of her lines with literally all of the enthusiasm of that actress who got kidnapped by Kim Jong-il. Yep. It's, it's yes. gunpoint she's saying these lines. So so much so that she has to keep saying her emotions at the end of them, right? This is the, like, because <laughs> she's like, this is like a dream. I'm so happy. And I went back and <laughs> that is the fifth time in this movie that someone just said their emotions after the words, I am, <laughs> right? It will not be the last. <laughs> so she said, he says, <laughs> Uh, where do you want to go? And I'm like, you've got to tell the horse-drawn carriage guy that before you get in, man. You're not allowed to just decide <laughs> along the way. But so then we we cut over to their honeymoon cabin for an aliveness montage. <laughs> yeah, and this cabin, when we see, we look around the cabin, at one point we do, you know, we have a good sort of shot around it, and I'm certain they got that cabin in return for taking the shots that they that they've taken and using them on Airbnb. Yep. So I think this is yet another case of like, if you just shoot some promotional footage for us, you can use this for an entire morning. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I wrote, what percentage of a movie can be montages before it's literally not a fucking movie anymore? Because <laughs> they're pushing that. Also, they're trying to do the sexy, because they know like sexy chocolate strawberries, but they, they didn't know where to get no goddamn Jewish chocolate strawberries. So they're just <laughs> sharing a goblet of chocolate mousse. Yeah. Oh, fucking, it's a big fucking glass of poop is what it looks like they're <laughs> doing. Yeah. Yeah, I thought she was feeding him Marmite from a fancy glass. <laughs> yeah. While while he's reading the Bible to her erotically. Why, like the he's sexy reading it like parts, he is yes. rock hard throughout the entire scene. It's so <laughs> dis disturbing and upsetting. And it's not the horse sperm part. There are sexy parts in the yeah, Bible. Yeah. <laughs> At one point, they're doing like sexy moose eating, which by the way, they suck it because it's just like, waving the spoon around in front of your face before you take it. Right, no, it's like, here comes the airplane into the hangar, yeah. <laughs> she, like, dabs him on the face with the moose, and he's like, okay, now you're wasting fucking moose. <laughs> I wrote in my notes, okay, <laughs> Keith wrote this movie. We're now watching Keith. <laughs> Look, we get fucked, just don't waste moose. You're wasting moose. So, meanwhile, okay, so then we cut to Brayden and his girlfriend at a diner talking about the wedding, Right. Oh my God. And they're, they're currently having coffee in what sounds like the corner of the state exhibition of aircon unit manufacturers. <laughs> it is so God, loud in the so background. Loud. Hey, can we turn off that super loud fan in the background while we shoot our movie? No. Cool. No problem. All, All right, right. Well, well there guess... you go. <laughs> also, this is Braden's girlfriend, Leslie, I think. And she, yeah. I realize in this scene that she looks like a sort of a less good Alicia Silverstone. Yeah. Like she's like Alicia Bronzerston at <laughs> best, <laughs> maybe lower. <laughs> Alicia did not place a stunt. <laughs> so, yeah, right. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and so she's like, I thought that was a lovely wedding. And, and Brayden goes like, I thought it sucked. Murder, murder, murder. And she's like, okay, well, I'm leaving. And he's like, no, you're not. Marry me. And she's like, okay. Yeah. Every little girl's dream. That if this scene went on for 20, it escalates so quickly. If this scene went on for 20 more seconds, they'd have had to make her pregnant as well. It just really <laughs> ramps up. <laughs> so, and then we didn't mention this before, but when, when, David was talking to his dad about the wedding. He says, yeah, you know, I bought a house for my wife. I'm going to show it to her afterwards, right? So this is her fucking surprise house. He's going to show her the surprise house that the two of them are going to live in. Yeah. Because he's an asshole. Look, this is a Christian movie, and they believe that, like, Jesus is going to come back with a sword in his mouth and fight the armies of Satan. But by far the least realistic thing they believe is that any woman would want to be surprised with the house she's going to live in for the next 30 years. Oh, yes. God, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when, when he drives up to what appears to be like a model housing estate. Like I, I genuinely half expected Michael Bluth to walk in while Ron Howard was narrating. <laughs> it was that much of a model housing estate. 
<laughs> yeah, so they they pull up to this house, which by the way, this this house would cost you four hundred grand in Wake Forest, fucking Georgia. So I like, oh, it's huge. Yeah, they could have used a young couple sized house, but they decided not to. Well, no, <laughs> yeah, because he explains here it's not just for two; it's for their seven children. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, uh huh. He they, he tells her that he wants to have seven kids, and she's like, oh, that's. T- a terrible idea. He's like, ah, 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 we're married and Christian. You don't have a say in this. And she's like, you're right. I don't. You're right. Don't. You're right. Oh, my God. And there's such a weird bit where he says, I want seven kids. And then she, then he says a moment later, so this is a house for nine. And she goes, nine? Like she hasn't realized that they'd both be there with the seven <laughs> yeah. kids. I don't know how she couldn't do seven <laughs> plus two in her head. Well, you know, she might be in the menstruation hut at the time. They are Christians. <laughs> yeah, for so- and this is also where we meet the neighbor kid and his dog. This is Peter and Snoopy. Uh, Peter is the kid. Snoopy the dog. Yes. Hello. I'm a child. I'm in your. I'm your friend now. Yep. You like me. Oh, you're a character, huh? He's like, I'm a fucking suspect if you can believe that shit. <laughs> so and then so they they were going to go into the house and she's like, hey, you know what? We should probably pray that there's no second act tragedy that moves the plot <laughs> forward once we get in there. And she's like, you know what? You're right. We should do that. And then we cut to Jacqueline and David. They're going on a picnic. And she's like, you know what? I've been craving pickles. And he says, you're having a baby. And she's like, I probably am. This movie is stupid. (laughs) Oh, and this is where I realized, like, when you're actually this stupid, you literally think someone is pregnant when they do old wives tale stuff. Like, it's not right. Because, like, I remember when Anna was pregnant, she would be like, oh, I'm a little nauseous this morning. We'd be like, maybe, right? But I I realized, like, idiots must actually be like, nope. Well, there it is. Why even bother with that expensive test from CB? (laughs) Oh, God. And because she was pregnant at this point, I really wanted to be pregnant with all seven kids at once. I thought that's where we were going. Septuplets. Yeah. This movie's a prequel to the Octomom. Yeah. Exactly. So, okay. So, so then we, we're, we're at a cookout. All the characters are there named and otherwise. And this is where, oh my God, David is going to announce to everybody that they're having a kid. Right. Yeah. Also, I was very distracted because they are, barbecuing, quote unquote, the most insultingly thin burger patties I have ever seen. They have like an, a quarter inch of burger burning to a crisp on the grill. For yeah. This <laughs> oh, it was Trumpian. It was downright Trumpian. Yeah, it was sad. So yeah, he, so David announces that they're going to have a kid. His sister-in-law, the AI chick that Marsh was telling you about earlier, is pissed as though there is a finite supply of kids and Jacqueline just cut in front of her in line. Yes, I I wrote, they were acting like they literally stole a baby out of her womb. Right. Yeah. And and the dad is not making this easy for anyone because he's sort of going, he's basically like, oh, thank God, there's a grandchild coming. I've been waiting for a grandchild for so long and I want him to turn to to, to Jenny. He's like, you know, not like this barren bitch over here. Am I right? (laughs) Up top, up top. Come on. Sahara. Sahara is what I call her because of the desert. Right. (laughs) So, and then the sister-in-law, this is Jenny is the character's name. She storms off so that she can cry about the fact that she's not having a baby. Right. Her husband, this character will eventually be named Henry, follows her and she like, I don't know, testicle shames him for not impregnating yes. her yet. She says, I blame you that I'm not a mother. I want, And I wrote in my notes, you just had to keep working with your laptop on your lap, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I wanted her, her to be explaining this to do with his very specific fetish. Like, look, I've told you before how this works. If you're doing it there, <laughs> it's not going to happen. I've told you so many times. <laughs> so, okay. So, meanwhile, we, we cut to David and Jacqueline. They're getting ready to go to church. And she goes, will you love me forever and ever and ever? And he goes, through all three acts, exactly. We'll be so (laughs) alive. And we're never going to die? No, we're never going (laughs) to die. Neither of us will ever die. So we get to church. The pastor's telling a boring story about sheep, and which is honestly like a pastor's job description, if you think about it. (laughs) But this is where we're going to sloppily introduce this. I love this character so much. Paul the robber. Yes. Oh, Paul's incredible. Yeah, everybody keeps saying, who's that guy? And they're like, oh, that's that's Paul. He's the guy who stole Jacqueline's car and purse, but then she forgave him, turned him into a Christian while he was in jail, and now he's friends with them. 
Right. And let's not forget, she's telling this story to David, which means they made it all the way to married and pregnant without yes. her ever telling him about the time she was robbed at gunpoint. Three years ago. Yeah. This happened, uh, the robbery happened three years ago and she never mentioned it and he never asked and it just never came up. She was robbed at gunpoint. It's it's incredible. And the fact she says about how like, you know, Paul's in, Paul's in church just to come and see me, not talk to her because he didn't talk to her. So he came all the way from prison, I think, to come and see her in church from afar. And everyone is just taking this like a totally normal thing. Like everyone in town is talking about this this new po- new guy, this new Paul guy that they've got these days. You know, have you seen this guy? We've got this guy, yeah, but no one is thinking this is a really fucking weird thing. Yeah, so, yeah, so, and, so, and then they, they're driving home and he's like, you know, I don't think we really fleshed that, um, that Paul character out at all. Would you like to do a flashback? She's like, I would like to do a flashback. <laughs> so we flashback to the day that she got carjacked and it's a very gentle carjacking right he's not very aggressive about it Mm. it's also very clear that they shot the scene where they talk about the thing before the actual (laughs) scene where they shot the flashback because there's a bunch of stuff that isn't true she'd be like i was in the middle of the parking lot nope you're in the middle of a garage i cried out to jesus and he stopped no he didn't we just saw the flashback (laughs) we saw the (laughs) flashback yeah, she's like, I cried out to Jesus, and that's when the carjacker backed off. I'm like, well, okay, but that's also like right after you gave him your keys and your purse. Yeah, they don't like, usually oh. hang around for noogies. Yeah, he, he backed <laughs> off in your car. He, it's not backing off; it's reversing. Is what he did. <laughs> and then, and then David plays the guitar at us again. He's like, oh, well, you know, every good carjacking story needs a guitar solo. And she's like, does it though? He's like, it does. It does. Blackbird singing in the dead of night. Oh God! And he concentrates so hard. Anything he tries to, every time he tries to pick out anything like remotely complex, he's really con- he's got his little tongue stuck out and everything. Is he's trying to find the strings? It's, yeah, it's great. He's, you can you can you can see his lips going and two and three and change. Yeah. So <laughs> all right. Well, I'll tell you what. To this point, the closest thing we have to a plot is. There were all these people once, so I'm not going to bother waiting for some obvious fucking act break. We're over time anyway. We're just going to pause there for a minute, but we'll be back in a flash with even more 70 times 7. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. And my trail mix. Eli, this is just a bag of chocolate chips. Yeah, that's my favorite part of trail mix. So I figure, you know, it's fine. It's fine. Hey, fellas, uh, where's, where's Eli going? Oh, Nevada. Why Nevada? Oh, it's for my mental health. I'm going to count those ballots, even if I have to do it myself. I just really can't wait anymore. I see. Well, Eli, you know, one way to take care of your mental health is therapy. Have you considered that? Sorry, Noah. Therapy's great, but I don't have time to schlep into someone's office. I've got ballots to count. Well, then why don't you try BetterHelp Online Therapy? What's BetterHelp Online Therapy? As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It couldn't be simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash awful. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash awful. Better help because not all problems are solved by count faster. <laughs> all right, lady, give me a purse and your keys. Here, here you go. Just don't hurt me. Back off. You hear me? Back off. Sorry. Um, how do I get? Oh, oh, it's the button on the console there. It's a button. Man, technology, huh? Um, okay. Okay. Now, how do I? Oh, you you have to you have to put your foot on the brake. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah, got it. Got it. Okay. Now I just uh, I got a um the, the backup cam. You got the backup oh. cam. Oh, nice. Good. Um, sorry. So do you have the the ticket thing for the parking? Oh yeah, no, but it's it's uh in my wallet. Oh, uh, purse that you took. Yep. Yeah, great. Got it. Got it. Wow, eleven bucks. Yeah. Who's the real criminal here? Am I right? Yeah. Totally. <laughs> okay. I'll never be in this movie again. You will not. No. Mm mm. and we're back for more of this shit we're going to rejoin the action with david and brayden back at the karate gym brayden is sick and damn tired of david and all his happiness and joy yeah i also i didn't get to mention this at like one of the other karate scenes but in the background of this taekwondo dojo they have an oath 
of some kind and one of the like commandments of the Taekwondo oath that is in the background of the scene. You can just read it is I will not misuse Taekwondo. And let me tell you, as a second degree Taekwondo black belt, very easy oath to keep. I've never, uh, <laughs> well, unless you make this stupid fucking movie. There you go. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> unless unless like, you try and impress someone by being a black belt, which in some ways is misusing Taekwondo. Exactly, exactly. It cannot impress people. I'm also a black belt. It cannot impress people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Second degree, Mars. Second degree. Oh, I was only first degree. Yeah, yeah. you you, you outranked oh, me. Oh, well, there you go. So now we know that Eli could kick Marsh's ass. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> <laughs> Suspicion confirmed. Well, wait, are we talking about drunk Marsh or sober Marsh? <laughs> Drunken master technique. I saw drunk Marsh rip the head off a of bouncer. Yeah, Q&A. right. No, that's fair. So, okay. So then we, we we get, like, again, all of these Taekwondo scenes are like four seconds long, right? Like one of them will push the other guy over and we'll move on to another scene, which is going to be, in this instance, David and Jacqueline planting seven little treelets as a symbol of the seven kids that they're going to have. <laughs> okay. And here's the thing. A little behind the scenes for you. When the guy made this movie, he was like, oh, it's going to be so cool. We'll plant the scenes in one scene. <laughs> and then... Throughout the movie, we'll watch the trees grow. <laughs> this guy's an idiot, and he doesn't know how long trees take to grow. Yes, so throughout yeah. the rest of the movie, he will be referencing how big the trees are or how big they've gotten or whatever, but it's exactly the same size because this movie yes. was shot in four days. Oh, <laughs> right. yeah, 100%. To the point where we see him take all seven trees out of the car from when he bought them, and they're all really small. And then the, the, we see them planted, and some of them have clearly trebled in size yes. and are not freshly planted. It's like, you already had some trees. That's why you brought this whole tree <laughs> metaphor in, is that the house that you were renting for the shoot had some trees. Right. And you've decided to work with that. Yeah. So we get that scene and then we're at another family function with all the characters. This is the sister-in-law, Jenny. It's her birthday. And at this point, Jacqueline is like visibly pregnant, right? Yes. So much so that Jenny can glare angrily at the uh, baby bump that that she doesn't have. Not murder, but maybe. Not murder, but maybe. (laughs) She constantly keeps bringing it up every single time she gets opportunity. She talks about how she doesn't have a baby. It's like, come on, Debbie Downer, stop bringing this up. Like, this isn't about you. Right. So, I, like, I wrote in my notes, sis in law sure wishes that they had a baby. Is her personality? Yeah. Because it's the <laughs> only thing she ever talks about in this film. She's staring so evilly at the baby bump. It looks like she's trying to abort the fetus with laser vision. <laughs> <laughs> so. At one point, the husband comes over and I wanted him so badly that he'd be like, hey, hey, what did we say about staring hatefully at someone's uterus, huh? Okay. (laughs) Go sit in the car. Oh, and this is where they very subtly introduce Jenny's earrings into the film. (laughs) Jenny, you have earrings on. Yes, I do. Would you like a close-up of them? (laughs) How about two? (laughs) Two close-ups in three scenes? Okay. And I really hoped it wouldn't matter. I really genuinely hoped it just (laughs) would not matter. I'd have had so much respect for this film if they never mentioned the earrings again. Like the necklace? Because, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So then we get them cleaning up, her and her husband cleaning up after the party and him going like, you know, you've got to get over this her being pregnant thing. And she's like, I literally, that's my entire... It's my only characteristic, man. I can't. I physically can't get over it. <laughs> yeah, she says, you're the older brother. I want her to be like, your cum is older, like a fine scotch. Why didn't it <laughs> work better? Be more mature. So then we got back over to David and Jackie's house where she's munching a pickle pregnantly. She is borderline fellating this pickle. <laughs> it, is, it is sexual. <laughs> And then, then the whole camera, it lingers on the jar, the, the almost empty jar of pickles, as if to say, when the last pickle is eaten, come the baby will. <laughs> it's like some sort of prophecy. Oh, it's so stupid. She's like, hey, can you pick me up more pickles? It's pregnancy food. And he's like, I will get you all the pickles. So many pickles. I will pickle the shit out of you or whatever. Oh, and I want him to come back with all of the pickles, just pallet after pallet after pallet. We're going to have seven pregnancies. It was buying in bulk. I'm saving so much money this one. Oh, there you go. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, when he said, I'm going to buy all the pickles, I just wrote in my notes, I will kill this movie script with a shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he goes outside to go to work. The neighbor kid is outside playing a game of accidentally throw my ball at your car as you walk up. Right? Okay. <laughs> And and he is going to, I'm going to throw this out there, 
aggressively hit on David's wife here. <laughs> yes. Aggr like this dude's looking to get banned from QED for life. <laughs> so you and your wife's like an open thing. I'll get to it. That just, you don't know until you ask. Yeah. <laughs> and then it possibly the weirdest turn in the entire movie. She calls him. She's watching this happen out the front window. She calls David and says, what were you just now talking to the kid about? Right. Like they've been fucking and she wants to make sure that Peter didn't tell him. <laughs> oh, God, it's so weird. It's so weird. Like, I find that incredibly strange. She also emphasizes to David so many times that don't be late, don't be late. You're always late, don't be late. And I thought, OK, this whole lateness thing is so heavily foreshadowed. What a good movie would do at this point is she arranges to meet him somewhere but he's late in getting to her because he's always late. And then then she gets shot either by the blonde guy or by the random drive-by guy. And then it's Paul the car thief who steals a car in order to take her to the hospital. Redemptive <laughs> arc. What? And then Jenny, the AI sister-in-law, it turns out that her earrings turn out to be made from highly potent cum and she can have a baby and it all wraps up neatly. Mm. It wasn't too late to fix it. That's what Marsh is saying. It wasn't too late to fix this. <laughs> it was doable. All right. So he goes to work. He gets another call this time from Braden. Braden's like, hey, man, you want to have coffee with me? What, what time do you uh, get home tonight? Are you going to be going home for lunch or anything? Or are you just gone for the whole day? Yeah. And does your home have any CCTV or? <laughs> <laughs> if you were going to discover a corpse today, for example, <laughs> just for what the time? Lane, <laughs> would you? what time? When would be the best time for you to not discover? I mean, it's great. Great. <laughs> so, so yeah, so he's at work. He's signing some papers. So we know that he's very, very busy, right? <laughs> and then his brother comes in to confront him about his wife being angry about the pregnancy thing. Now, again, small thing, but like the brother's suit is comically oversized. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Clown is a lawyer oversized. Yeah. <laughs> And the, the energy of this scene is really weird from the way that the brother walks in. He's acting like he's going to ask his brother for a loan, but like a loan of cum? Is that what he's doing? <laughs> I come to you hat in hand. <laughs> <laughs> this movie has so little idea how movies work that he's like, oh, well, did you go to a doctor? And he's like, yeah, no, we went to the doctor. <laughs> and that's it. It mm. doesn't say what the <laughs> yes. doctor is like. Like, he no. just went to the doctor and they were like, we can't have a baby. And the doctor was like, that fucking sucks, my guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so they talk about that for a little while. This is like the 47th time somebody tells him, hey, you know, in God's, in God's time, she'll get pregnant or whatever. And then we get this, like, Work in the office montage that is for some reason set to the shopping music from a 90s JRPG. Yep. It's such a bizarre, mm -hmm. it's a bizarre montage, but we see each of the brothers. We see one brother and we follow him and then the other brother walks in the shop and we follow him and then we turn the corner and we see the dentist. It's like, oh, they're trying to do that like shot in the Avengers where you see them all in action <laughs> one by one. Oh, okay. But it's just them in an office signing things a bit. Oh, God, this is the cinematographer showing off. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wow, you're right, it mm -hmm. is. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So David's driving home. He calls his dad and he's like, yeah, dad, I'm feeling really foreshadowing. Like this movie's going to break out in a plot any second now. And he uses his phone while he's driving more often than Eli does. It's ludicrous. <laughs> Every single shot is him on his phone while driving. Somebody was going to kill his wife. He's right? playing Candy Crush. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I'm surprised he didn't hit his own wife with a car. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so he pulls up. He's brought her flowers because it's their six month anniversary. Hello. Obviously. Yeah. In the world's largest vase as well. Yes. Like, it's not just like a bunch of flowers. It's already in a vase that he carefully lifts out of the car. Yeah. Uh, and so he, he walks in and he's like, you know, he's like, Jacqueline, Jacqueline goes into the kitchen, doesn't find her there, doesn't, he thinks for a minute about where else he should look. Right? <laughs> he's calling her like he's trying to find out where the cat's gone. Like he's expecting yeah. to be sleeping <laughs> on a pile of towels somewhere. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> shakes or treats or something. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, but eventually he's like, oh, you know, I should check for her upstairs. 
And and we have this really ominous walking up the stairs bit where I'm like, I'm I'm excited, right? I'm writing in my notes. Oh, guys, there might be a plot at the top of those stairs. I'm I'm pretty stoked about this. Is it strange that the more like as he as the more upstairs he gets, the more the music seems to transition to like Egypt or something? By the time he opens the bedroom door, we're getting basically a call to prayer in the background. I thought, oh, <laughs> yeah. Did they move next door to a mosque? Is that why this neighborhood is so empty all of the time? <laughs> it's right in the middle of the nearest mosque. Yeah, so, but of course, he finds his wife. She's been shot right in the fetus, <laughs> right? Finds her dead in the... And, and, and he literally says, Jacqueline, who did this to you? <laughs> is the plot now. So just, it's such a dumb fucking Jacqueline, lie. Jacqueline, who made you fall on ketchup and then also get a little <laughs> on your hands? <laughs> So, yeah, but she's been shot and he's devastated. And then we get this great scene. Okay, so apparently the whole church gathered up to watch the cops remove her dead body. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's talk about the body. Can we talk? Because you mentioned that this was almost your best worst. And I think that was true for all of us. Yeah. They are <laughs> rough with this body. They are... You hired movers that you found on a telephone pole with this body. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's not helping that this house has the spiral staircase from a medieval castle. Yeah, right, the only exactly. access point to right. the upper no, floor. The stairs are like you're worried about like making sure that your enemy has to attack right-handed against the wall or some <laughs> shit. You know, so and 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 they're bringing and we watch for so long these two elderly actors who have clearly never carried a fucking body down a st <laughs> set of stairs on stretchers have to carry this fight. They're banging it against the They, wall I, they might as well be kicking it down the stairs like a moody teenager's <laughs> backpack on the way to the first day of school. Cool. Oh, God, that scene was worth the price of admission, folks. So then we cut to David. He's satting at a gravestone that we only see from the back because we don't need to see the front. Just trust us. It's carved. <laughs> yeah. The number of episodes that I'm on this show that we cut to a graveyard mid-scene. It's, it's oh. Every single film cuts to a graveyard at some point. Yeah. yeah. So then he goes back home, walks around his yard, has blurry memories. Yeah, this is a really ugly garden as well. Like these people have the worst taste and I'm glad she's dead. This is such an ugly garden. It's so overdone. Yes, thank you. Yeah, going for a walk by your cul-de-sac's water feature doesn't have the same gravitas <laughs> this guy was hoping for. <laughs> also, I just have to point this out. It's just a tiny thing, but during the flashback at one point, Jacqueline like plays with the wind chime like a toddler and he has to be like, uh, 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 honey, honey. <laughs> oh, okay. she plays a bit like a cat. Maybe she is a cat. Oh, okay. Maybe that explains it. He's trying yeah. to find her in the house. She's, oh, I think this makes sense. That's why they had to put that weird ass wig on her. Yeah. To make her look like a human being. To yeah, it cover makes, up makes the sense. ears. Yeah, that makes sense. So Eli, this wind chime scene, they were so fucking proud of this because this is like the natural effect because we see her and him sitting down together and she stands up and plays with the wind chime and then we go back and the seat's empty but he like in the future stops the wind chime like they were oh. so proud of the scene but it was so fucking stupid because to get there it had to be like you know a baby batting at a mobile or whatever yeah. a fully grown woman had to be like wind chime go bing bong <laughs> yes yes oh there's a the, yeah at the very end of it this is where he like he goes to like uproot that sapling right but like they rented this fucking thing on, on Airbnb. They can't pull up the fucking sapling. So he changes his mind halfway through. <laughs> no, no, I won't. I won't pull this tree out, even though I totally could. Yeah, I could. <laughs> one of the one of the rules that was on a laminated piece of uh, paper in the kitchen was do not touch the shrubbery. So, OK, <laughs> yeah, it was, the, it was just above the thing about the dishwasher and just below that rule about the hot tub and not getting it right. Yes. Yeah, there was a shrubbery rule. Forgot about that. We'd lose our deposit. Yeah, so he gets all sad and he goes, I will find who did this to you is the plot, Noah, is the plot. It has a plot now. Oh, and I really wanted the killer to be Paul and for the moral to be forgive no one. Forgiving yeah. a guy who literally <laughs> held you at gunpoint was stupid. He's going to break out and kill you. Don't ever forgive people. See, my money at this point was on Snoopy the dog for making him be in this stupid fucking movie. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, and then he goes to the to the gravestone again, right, to mourn his wife some more. And the decapitated My Little Pony is on her headstone, just like in his dream sequence from earlier that I didn't realize was a dream sequence until I saw this scene. <laughs> so he's psychic then, right? He's psychic. So this, this whole movie takes on a totally different tone. He's psychic. Well, God gave him a vision. 
Marsh, uh, as, as yeah. God is that often wont to do. That is true. A very specific vision, which, by the way, he doesn't acknowledge here, right? He's not like, wait a second, I had exactly this dream. He's like, hmm. Well, also, it's like such a dick move from God because it's not like it doesn't help him any in any way to have foreseen this. No, right? he could, you could have showed the vision of her being shot and that right, would be so yeah, much more useful. Yeah, <laughs> Exactly. He could have got ADT or something. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then, by the way, he sits down against the gravestone to like be sad and they accidentally show us that it's blank on both sides. <laughs> they do show us that. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then mid, mid mope, Braden shows up and he's like, apparently I've just been off to the side this whole time. <laughs> I could mope with you if you wanted. And he says, yeah, no, that'd be great, man, if we moped together against her grave for a minute. Yeah, I really wanted to be like, ha, not so wife and child now, are you? Ha, in your face. <laughs> <laughs> but instead, David's like, you know what? I'm going to find who did this and I'm going to kill him. And Braden's like, I hope. <laughs> he's so chipper. <laughs> yeah, no, that's the yeah, that's the inflection of it is, yeah, you know, I'm in. I'll help you move. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> can I help? <laughs> so and then so we get apparently dad the boss has called David and his brother in for a you still believe in God though right conversation. <laughs> All right, sons. Uh, I know I know we have a big busy day of paper signing to get to, but I um, <laughs> just wanted to check in that at least Jesus is still everyone's Lord and Savior. <laughs> so and David's like, I don't know if he is my Lord and Savior. And all the cartoon birds gasp together, you know, or whatever. Okay. He says, where was God when my wife was shot? But he says it like God is a suspect in the murder. Not, <laughs> not like he's doubting his faith. It's a real, uh, real tone thing. Yeah. But dad says, never reject God's love. Never doubt him. And he's like, eh, you can sometimes you should probably doubt him, man. Yeah. He has this moment where he's like, look, son. Someday you'll be totally okay with God murdering your wife and unborn child. I promise you. And it's like, why? Well, yeah. I don't think totally okay. <laughs> you <laughs> you'll then. thank God. No, you'll thank him for this. So, but David leaves without mending his relationship with Christ. It's still act two. And he stomps out. He, he stomps out past the flirty secretary. And there's this amazing moment where she starts praying for him, but can she pray for him in time? <laughs> bum, bum. <laughs> they literally, they do a parallel on it where he goes home and he's considering suicide, but she's praying for him. But can she get to the amen before he pulls the trigger? Yeah. Oh God, is interrupted suicide attempt on our bingo card? Because at this point, it should basically be the free square. Yeah, no oh, shit. Oh God, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good point. Also, he gets the gun from like just a, a cupboard near the front door and that is not a safe <laughs> place to store a gun. Like this guy's kid was going to die at some point regardless. They just got it over <laughs> with sooner. <laughs> yeah. From a gunshot wound. Yeah, he, did, he didn't have a chance to get attached. It's fine. It was fairer this way. Yeah, right. I did almost go with best worst gun safety because this is very clearly one of the people who made this movie's real gun and he's fucking spinning it around on his finger. Yeah. He's picking his teeth with it. It is <laughs> terrifying. He scratches his ass with it at one point. Yeah. He does genuinely pick his teeth with it. He genuinely sucks on the end of it while he's thinking. Like, he he, does, like yeah. it's a pencil he's <laughs> absent mindedly holding. Yep. So, yeah, but just as he's about to shoot himself, there's a ring on the doorbell and he goes to answer it where he finds a fucking ponytail cop and his partner, right? Mm -hmm. And so now he's going to confront the, the cops. Because the cops still don't know who her killer is. And they're like, you know, like, we're thinking you, man, at this <laughs> point. So maybe you don't want to hurry us along. But why would Jay know where the body is? It doesn't matter. I am, I am a cop. <laughs> <laughs> this is the actual interaction that goes down. We have a few questions. So you're saying I need to find the killer myself? Yes. <laughs> that is literally it. <laughs> yes. So... Yeah, he goes, they, they, they go, we have a few more questions for you. And he's like, you should be on the streets trying to find the killer. And I'm like, dude, you live in the crime scene. Yeah, so many movies com confuse police work with hide and seek. It's not like he's out there like, and he's waiting for you to count to 100. <laughs> have you checked all the boats? He could be in a boat. Yeah. <laughs> so also, they ask him, where were you when your wife was murdered? I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Has he not told them that? Like, why hasn't he told No wonder they think he's suspicious and maybe a suspect yeah. if he's not going to tell them where he was when his wife was killed. Because we know the answer to that. He was at work and he's got loads of alibis. Why is he hiding that? 
Right. Yeah, exactly. They're like, he's, they're like, well, you know, of course you're obviously a suspect. And he's like, get out of my house. And I'm like, you didn't make it better, man. Yeah. They say, he said, they say, we need your cooperation. And he says, and I quote, have you ever held the body of somebody that you love so dear? That's it. That's the end of the sentence. <laughs> yeah, it's like, psst, you forgot to say dead. It's really important <laughs> you say dead body. Because otherwise, yes. I really wanted the cop to be like, Lee, sorry, dear Lee. I, I know it's not that time. It's, it's going to bother me if we leave without saying it. <laughs> he also says, you need to be out there on the streets looking for suspects. I was like, what does he picture they're going to find, quote, on the street? Right, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. But, but then at the end of the scene, he's just like, leave. And they just do, you know, but but huffily. You know how cops, right. when, you, when you're just like, get out, they just do. Yeah, right. Especially when you're a murder suspect. Yeah, that's that's being all cagey about where he was on the night of the murder. Yeah, while holding a gun. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. And then, OK, so then dad pulls up to check on him. Now, he's left his gun just sort of sitting on the table next to the door. So there's this bizarre moment where he's like, you know what? I should put it in the back of my my pants, you know, like they do in the movies. But then the actor remembers, I think, that it's a real gun and that's a terrible idea and then just puts it back. Yep. Yeah. So effectively, we watch him scratch a high ass crack itch with a Glock. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I, I need to be clear. We're not using hyperbole here. The two things we have watched this actor do with what is unquestionably a real gun is pick his teeth and scratch his ass. Yes. 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 Genuinely does. <laughs> so, yeah, but dad comes in. And he's like, you know, I've been praying about this a lot. And God says that you should come live with me at this point. Yeah, this is what David says. I feel like the killer could walk in at any moment. But why would you feel that? Why, right. why would the killer be coming back here now? There's no, he's got no motive to do that unless it's to like gloat. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> or check his work, right? <laughs> I was just wondering how the investigation is going. <laughs> Yeah, so the dad's like, no, you should move in with me. And he's like, I really don't want to do that. And he's like, well, you know, I, I could tell you all about how Jesus is our strength and our hope. And he's like, yeah, that's why I don't want to do that, man. It's because <laughs> you won't shut up about the Jesus shit. And th this is where he's been he's been dead wifed into atheism, which you, know, you hate to see it. You absolutely yeah, hate to see yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But the thing is, his mom's already dead. So did God try the cancer momming? fail and then went for plan B the wife. Oh like right. How many, how many cracks at atheism is God given this guy? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so and then so dad notices the gun at this point, right? And he's like, hold on a second. What are you doing with this? And David goes to grab it. The dad throws it away. Like he's playing <laughs> keep away with the dude's hat or something. <laughs> okay. This is fucking amazing because what was supposed to happen here is these actors were supposed to struggle for the gun, right? And someone, some saint on this set was like, hey, sorry, everyone involved in this film is an idiot. That's a real gun. There's no way we choreograph this film without someone dying. So you guys are going to have to do cartoon shenanigans for the gun instead, which involves dad throwing the gun down. And when David goes to get it, he steps on his fingers like Jerry and fucking Tom. Yes. <laughs> Yes. And then and and then David has to like way overreact like a fucking French footballer or something. He's like, oh my God, my fingers like now can't go for the gun and ow. Yeah, he's rolling around, he's demanding a yellow card, he's uh, he's going all in for it. Yeah. And the dad's like, Hey, look, man, you're gonna get to see your dead wife and kid in heaven. And he's like, I don't believe in heaven anymore. And he's like, Well, if you start believing in heaven again, that fixes that. And he's like, It does, that would fix that. But hang on, his kid was like six months, he was a six month old fetus. He was minus three, is his six month old fetus in heaven? Like all <laughs> pink and slimy and underdeveloped. Or does Jenny like go to heaven pregnant and have to give birth there? <laughs> Either way, it kind of sucks. All right, so then we, we go back to him on a horse. Again, they, they keep putting him on horses. There's never a fucking reason for it. But damn it, if there aren't flashbacks on the horse too, right? Yeah. Yeah, this is her saying that she wants to take their baby on a mission trip right <laughs> yes. after it's born. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Hey, I want to go somewhere that definitionally is less safe for our baby as soon as he's born. And he's like, that's a great idea. Yeah. Well, doesn't he say, how about we take the baby with us? Yes. Like, as opposed to what? Leave it here? Like give birth <laughs> and then drop it in the hospital and go? <laughs> So yeah, so he has that flashback and then he goes back home. He sees Peter playing with Snoopy, 
Oh, this is the scene where he's like, he's taking his gun to work with him, but he's throwing it just in the trunk loose. Why is he put it in the back of the car? Because th- that's the last place that he can get to it if he needs it. He's got a glove box. I thought that's what glove boxes in America were for, were for handguns. Right. No, we, co- they, we call them gun boxes here. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> But this is the actual line. This is so, this is so good. This is so indicative of the fucking dialogue in this movie that was written down and then printed out and then you paid someone to say it. He says, the kid says, hey, is that a gun? Can I touch it? And David says, hey, that's not for you to touch with, okay? It's not for little kids. <laughs> <laughs> oh god people it was just two hours of that and then so he drives off peter gives him a very i'm glad i shot your wife look right this is the moment where we're supposed to go like wait did the kid do it yeah <laughs> can't fuck his wife can't play with his gun this won't let me do anything <laughs> <laughs> and then i guess this is supposed to be david's oscar clip it, it makes no sense in the movie so i'm assuming that he thought this one was the, the one that was going to win him all the awards because this is the scene where he's walking by that fountain. He gets a phone call from we don't know who. And for reasons that we don't know, he just starts screaming, they think I killed my own wife in public. But they don't think that. All they said was, you've refused to tell them stuff that would rule you out as a suspect. Just tell them that you are like where you were. You've got a rock solid alibi. Why are you hiding that? <laughs> that is fucking weird. Right. Yeah. But then he screams into his phone that he's going to find who did that and kill them. Again, just cries that out in public. And then he goes to a fucking Korean barbecue to meet Brayden for lunch. Which is the weirdest choice. It's so strange. First of all, Hot Pot is a fucking insane choice in the middle of a vengeance movie. (laughs) Okay, do you guys know how this works? No, do you mind showing us? Okay, so we get a variety of meat and He might as well go to literally Benny Hanna and be sitting there brooding (laughs) while they make a fucking onion volcano in front of him. This is a tiny notch below Benny Hanna. But it's incredible because he's at a Korean barbecue. So this movie has been set between a Taekwondo dojo and a Korean (laughs) barbecue. Was this film paid for in part by the Korean Office for Cultural Impact? (laughs) If the killer turns out to be John Cook from BTS, we'll know that's what this was. (laughs) So so yeah, so he goes to to have Korean barbecue with Brayden. And there's just this hilariously large number of plates on the table I paused yes. it. He's ordered 11 dishes and he's what? spooned some of them onto David's plate before he got here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's so silly. Look, it's Korean like- barbecue is delicious, but this is such a such a silly... F- I mean, they might as well be doing like... You know when you can go to Ethiopian place and get that big bread thing in the center of the table that everyone dips into the... It's, just, <laughs> it's too festive. It's significantly too festive. You know, it, it reminded me of the scene in, in Pretty Woman where Richard Gere just bought her one of everything for breakfast or whatever it had that kind of a feel to it yeah so and then they sit down to their korean barbecue and and brayden's like so um did you figure out who killed your wife yet and he's like nah no clues and he's like you know who i would frame i mean who think oh i think did it is uh jenny <laughs> remember the the ai sister-in-law she was super jealous that was her her, her whole personality yeah and so david leaps to his feet as though he has just been shown bloody fingerprints and a video and storms out of the restaurant. So apparently he was just going to go and accuse the first person anyone suggested. Right. Yeah, 100%. And as he storms out, and again, this shows you how this film was financed, he storms out out of the door of the restaurant and we linger for a while on the door of the restaurant, which includes the name of the restaurant, the phone number for the restaurant, and the restaurant's opening time. (laughs) And it's so clear. (laughs) That's why they had that delicious spread of 11 delicious looking dishes laid out when the shot started, because this is their advertising material. <laughs> oh my God, you're right. Yeah, the only thing that could have been sillier is if he had stopped at the host and been like, I'm sorry, I would totally have enjoyed that delicious meal, including your weekly specials Tuesday through Friday from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. But I've got to go avenge the death of my wife. I'll see you at Taekwondo on Wednesday. <laughs> I've got to be somewhere, but first, I've got this bill. There must be a mistake. This bill is way too cheap. You've clearly <laughs> undercharged me. What? This is how much it actually costs, but this is great value. <laughs> Just use the offer code dead wife to yeah, get right. 10% off. <laughs> so then, okay, so then he goes to his brother's house to confront murder Jenny, right? 
he walks, he storms and he's got his gun, mm. right? He storms into the house and he's like, I demand to talk to Jenny. And Jenny comes in. She's like, oh, David, how have you been? Give me a big hug. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I, let me say, I'm so sorry you lost your wife really takes the wind out of your murder accusation. He's like, Jenny, I'm so oh, uh, thank you very much. Oh, you made brownies. Um, <laughs> it totally plays out exactly like that. too. Yeah. Oh. And then the dad comes along. So David had walked in shouting, where's Jenny? She killed my wife. They have a shouty argument about this. And then the dad turns up at the end like, hey, guys, what's up? Like, you didn't hear the violent yelling? Yeah. You just turned up at this point? So it was in the middle of a difficult shit. Sometimes you just got to let it finish on its own. Yeah, <laughs> apparently. But now, importantly, he doesn't accuse her of, of killing his wife, right? He just comes in screaming with a gun and then they calm him down. He's like, you know what? Never mind this. I didn't think this through. You're way too nice. It's You're making it awkward. I'll be back later. Sorry, I shouldn't have just accused someone of murder because someone else said their name near me. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then he has some more ominous dream sweet sequences and and at the end of it, he wakes up in his car, right? But we don't know why why he would be sleeping in his car. Yeah, we have absolutely no idea. His car seems to be parked in the black void from the film Under the Skin as well. Like, there's no scenery around this. It's completely right. pitch black around him. We've got no idea why he's in this car. And it doesn't matter that he's in this car, apart from the fact that he spends most of this film on horseback or in his car arriving at places. Right. Yeah. This is how poorly edited the movie is. He yes. wakes up from the car, then he pulls up to the house, and then we see him waking up on a couch. Yeah. So was he pulling up to wake himself up from a nap? <laughs> yes. What the what fuck the is fuck happening? Was he dreaming of pulling himself into the drop? Was he dreaming of pulling up? <laughs> like so much of this film opens with David waking up at the start of a scene. It's it's more than memento. More often than memento yeah. do we see that in this. Right, right. Or maybe yeah, this is a dream within a dream kind of thing, inception style. I don't yeah. So we cut to him pulling up to the house that we just saw him asleep in. And Peter, the neighborhood kid comes to talk with him and he's like hey man just so you know if you're if the plot is that you're trying to find the murderer i would be happy to be your pint-sized sidekick yes hey i'm really sorry about jacqueline she was like amazing spank bank material so uh <laughs> Um, and I really wanted this kid to help hunt the killer. It's like a kind of a Batman and Robin situation, yeah. like a, a cop and a half with Burt Reynolds. I really wanted that for the, for the rest. <laughs> Absolutely. But we find out this kid has been like, he knows what's been going on because his parents told him about it. Yeah. And I like the idea that his parents are just casually chatting about how David is trying to find the killer. Like they're at the window, the neighbors with the curtain twitching. Oh, I see that David fellow's back from the Korean barbecue again. I expect he's acting out a bloody vengeance for the deaths of his wife and unborn children. <laughs> also, the people at number 16 who put their recycling out on the wrong day again. It's all happening in this cul-de-sac. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so he goes inside his house. There's this great moment because he walks by and there's this big picture of Jesus hanging up over his mantle and he looks at it and he's like, all right, you'll stay up for now. <laughs> <laughs> well, has, have you seen how high his mantle is? It's above his eye level. It is genuinely above his eye level. The mantle of the fireplace. Yeah. Like, he'd have to tippy toe to get one of those vases down. It's just, <laughs> why would anybody want that in their house? Well, yeah, because then he does, right? Because he takes down yeah. the Jesus picture and starts yelling at it. <laughs> yeah. He also, th this is just such a tiny moment, but I have to talk about it. These people are garbage. So they have one of those super duper expensive massage chairs. Oh, Jesus. And he flops down into it. But it just looks like he has a Nintendo Switch glued to the arm of his chair. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was, I genuinely thought it was a tiny TV screen. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just so for it, honestly based on this movie so far, I was sure he was going to be like, "I got this at Sharper Image for only twenty one hundred dollars. <laughs> it has over fifty five settings and can work for more than an hour. So, <laughs> but nothing can work the tension out of my body now that my wife is gone." <laughs> at this point, if there were a Christian movie made up entirely of filler of other Christian movies, it's this movie. Okay, yeah. That would make a lot of sense, actually. So, yeah. So, th then he's like, you know what? I, you know, this movie's not going anywhere. I should go upstairs and examine the crime scene for the first time in the film. Right? <laughs> Feels like you know, have thought of that by now. But he hadn't. He goes upstairs. There's this, you know, there's this moment where it's like, oh, can he bring himself to go back in there where he found his? Oh, he can. He can. He's already going in. Never mind. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry to get the music all built up. He can because the bedroom up here, the master bedroom suite, is too spacious to resist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even with that minaret right outside the window, it's still fine. It's still lovely in here. <laughs> Look at all this sunlight. Oh my gosh, gorgeous! <laughs> but this is where he finds. <gasps> 
Jenny's earring sitting oh. on the ground. And I called this, I called you it did. from when we focused did, on the yep. earring, then when he went to see Jenny, I even wrote, she's not wearing an earring, I'm fucking Sherlock Holmes here. <laughs> And then you found the earring. But then I thought, oh shit, there's 35 minutes left in this. It's a plant. It's got to be a plant. It's going to be someone else. Yeah. So I saw this whole thing coming. Well, because you're sure like fucking homes. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. Marsh nailed his prediction and we're all happy to learn that the scenes do sometimes connect to one another in this movie. So we're going to pause on a high note. But first, let me have act through the hard sell. Will the movie ever explain the guy who shot at him? Will the fact that they do karate ever factor into the story? Will we ever hear anything at all about Paul the carjacker again? Find out that the answer to one of these questions is yes when we return for the gangly conclusion of 70 times 7. And those mango steens, are they fresh? <laughs> okay, well, what does the shipping label say? Yes, I will hold while you check. Is one of you on the phone? It's been busy for like 20 minutes. Wait, sorry. Does the podcast of Earth's house have a landline? Uh, uh, apparently, yes. Anyway, it's it's Eli. He's been ordering all the fancy cooking stuff that he learned on Masterclass. Wait, what's Masterclass? With Masterclass, you can learn from the world's best minds, anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. You can learn how to skateboard from Tony Hawk, improve your chess skills with Gary Kasparov, or learn cooking from Gordon Ramsay and a bunch of other famous chefs. With over 180 classes from a range of world-class instructors, that thing you've always wanted to do is closer than you think, including fancy cooking, apparently. Sorry, did you say a Cornish game hen? No, 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 no. Chris, I need an Istanbulian game hen. Yes, I'll hold again. <laughs> it's true. I was a Masterclass customer even before they became a sponsor. I love their cooking classes, but they also have classes on everything from comedy to magic, which is why I, Eli Posnick, personally endorse it as a product. Yes, Chris, what's the word on those hens? Thank you. I highly recommend you check it out. So this holiday, give one annual membership and get one free. Go to masterclass.com slash awful today. That's masterclass.com slash awful. Terms apply. All right, then. Good to know, I guess. So uh, when, when is dinner? Uh, four to six months. It depends on custom with the hens. I think I'm going to just order a, a pizza. Lauren. What is it, David? Yeah, David, what's the meaning of this? How could you? How could? What, what do you mean? You killed Jenny. No, I didn't. Oh. Okay, sorry about that. See you around. Okay. Well, that was that was weird. Yeah, I, I can't believe David would just accuse you of Lauren. David, I'm back. You were the last to see her. Why? Why did you kill Jenny? You killed Jenny. David, David, just because she was the last to see Jenny doesn't mean she killed her. Oh, it doesn't. Never mind then. Sorry, I'll see you guys nope, around doesn't, later. Doesn't mean that. At all. Also, if you've got like any evidence you want to handle now so you can just stop walking back in here, you should ask right now. Nope, nope, I'm good. No more evidence. You, you sure? Yep, all good. Okay. Man, that guy. I Lauren! <laughs> Damn it, David, what? Well, where did you get that burger you were talking about the other night? Bennigan's. Bennigan's, right. Did you kill my wife? No. Got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back for still more of this shit. And we're going to rejoin the action with David getting pulled over on his way to revenge murder Jenny in what may be, and I know how stiff the competition is, the most useless scene in the entire goddamn movie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> right. This was here to prove to us that they had marked police car kind of money. Right, but I don't think they did because later we see a very long lingering shot of the logo of Douglas County Sheriff's Office police car. And I think, again, this is yet another promotional shot that they've managed to get <laughs> just comped in their film. All right, look, if you're going to use Douglas County, I want you to show a full pullover speed trap situation, but our cops need to look like they're the good guys, all right? I wanted to really... Yeah. I want him to check in multiple times. Yeah, we're going to use this as evidence to the media that not every traffic stop ends in us shooting someone because we've had a patchy, <laughs> patchy record at least, but we can do it. Yeah, no, that that is actually way better than my theory of he just drove real fast through residential neighborhoods until somebody pulled him over. But yeah. <laughs> But yeah, so they pull him over, check his license, let him go. This never comes up again in any way whatsoever. 
it doesn't even make him too late. Like, I really no. wanted him to be delayed. He's gone to Jenny's house. I wanted him to be delayed by the cop and get there too late. And now Jenny's dead as well. It's, oh, yeah. how does this keep happening to me? <laughs> so, but no, but he runs, he walks into the house, gun in hand. <laughs> and he screams, Jenny, how could you kill my wife? And she's like, I, 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 I don't, I didn't. I didn't is how I did. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. You. Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> he says, I have evidence. Well, if you listen carefully, he shouts, I have an evidence. <laughs> yes, <laughs> an evidence. Yes. <laughs> Now, to be fair, Christians don't know what that word means, just as, as sort of like it's it's a prerequisite to Christianity. But what he has is her earring, which could have wound up in their bathroom in more ways than she dropped it while shooting my wife to death, right? Yeah. And like, I think that's actually quite a difficult way for her earring to end up there. Like she was the shooter and her earring just fell out in the bathroom and she was so careless as to not notice and not check and leave evidence around. That's right. the least un the, the least likely way for that earring to get there. But also like, so he found the earring, he picked it up, he put it in his pocket and he drove over to her house with it, right? So now the cops who already have said that he's a suspect have to trust him that the earring he found was in the room where his wife was killed, <laughs> right? So he actually ruined an evidence. He did. He did absolutely do that. But that doesn't matter. He, he calls the cops and he's like, I found the real killer. And they're like, oh, well, you called dibs on killer. So I guess we'll have to go arrest her, right? So they go arrest her. And just in case that is how it works, by the way, I just found Lauren Boebert's earring next to a murder. <laughs> so weird. Along with 200 votes for her opponent. <laughs> yeah, to get her arrested, all you have to do is make a single phone call to the police. The police are that responsive instantly, immediately on the scene. And it's the traffic stop sheriff as well. So the one police officer in yeah. uniform for this entire area comes to do it. Right, right, exactly. So yeah, so the the we cut to the pastor seeing the news of this right on, on, on TV and he's like oh honey let's pray we know that Jenny isn't the murderer it's too early in the film for that so uh, we should <laughs> well we, we first we cut to the news on TV which is weird for a couple of reasons one is that they use a stock like a stock audio for the news sting and it's a piece of stock audio that George Robb and I'm pretty sure Cognitive Distance have both used in the past <laughs> so that's the kind of budget that we're talking here yeah, uh -huh. but the news shows us footage of Jenny being arrested. But there weren't any cameras there when she was right, arrested because yes. we saw, apart from the movie's camera, which is the shot that we're seeing, which is <laughs> yes. really confusingly meta. <laughs> I also love that as they're arresting him, the cop says, do you have any weapons? And I wrote, yeah, man, she has a machete in her Ann Taylor pants. <laughs> <laughs> also, the news bulletin opens with the anchor saying, on a more serious note, more serious than what? This is the opening of the news. <laughs> you haven't said it. There wasn't a non-serious note prior to this that you're opening on. What's, what's hilarious is to think that this was like their follow up to the like, you know, clown story or whatever, <laughs> you know, and then that, that was In the biggest news. cookie ever baked. <laughs> and on a more serious note, murder. <laughs> They've and finally with the, the death of a pregnant lady. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So, and of course, Brayden is also watching the news, right? He's watching the news with his wife and she's like, oh, I don't think Jenny could murder somebody like that. And Brayden's like, what are you trying to say that I framed her for it? What the fuck are you trying to say? <laughs> yeah. I'll murder you. Sorry. Sorry. I just hate it when people don't believe other people murdered each other. <laughs> <laughs> what he says is, what do you mean? There's tons of evidence against her. Like, yeah, for example, there's that one earring that I don't know about yet. <laughs> Case closed. <laughs> and then he has, to, uh, look, I just like to point this out. This actress has to kiss the actor who plays Brayden. And this actress is Alicia, not placed stone, is actually pretty decent, <laughs> but not in this moment. She's kissing. She's like, yeah, she's she's kissing the way people took a shot of Malort at QED. <laughs> mm, yummy. Lips are close enough. <laughs> this counts enough for the check. Yeah, right. So, yeah, so so then we get like David, he's at work signing papers again. And the brother comes in to yell at him for having his wife arrested, because in this universe, it's, you know, the victim's next of kin gets to decide who is arrested for the crimes. <laughs> but 
what happened then in this universe? What happened is like, yes, this brother is angry that his wife has been falsely arrested for murder, but he still turned up to work with <laughs> or even for the brother who accused her of murder. Like, oh, I mean, look, I know that my brother accused my wife of murder and we're all worried about everything, but those papers aren't going to sign themselves. So we, <laughs> exactly, yeah. We've got to get back to the paper signing mill. Yeah, that's, the other thing too is that he works for his dad. You yeah, know, I really want there to be like a birthday at the office and they're angrily saying, happy birthday <laughs> to <laughs> Kathy from HR. <laughs> <laughs> so then we head back over to Jacqueline's blank headstone and damn it if that decapitated My Little Pony isn't back on the headstone again. Yeah, and th this will never be clarified in the flashbacks, but since we do know that Brayden killed her because we have eyes and can see, this also means there's a cut scene from the movie where Brayden doesn't find the beheaded little My Little Pony and he's like, well, I was making a murdery gesture. Great. Now I got to get like him at the dollar store buying another My Little Pony. He's <laughs> on eBay. He's got to get the like legit, <laughs> legit one or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Buying him in bulk just in case. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> He's standing by himself at the David standing by himself at the headstone. He goes, I just can't believe it was Jenny is is what I'm thinking in my head now. <laughs> I just can't believe the plot of this film's resolved. I think we've got like 25 minutes left. This is strange. <laughs> I'm so sorry is my emotion. <laughs> so then he's back at work. The secretary comes in. She's like, hey, you know, I, 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 I have more papers for you. Also, like, obviously, Jenny didn't kill your wife. There's still 20 minutes in the movie left, like Marsh said. Okay, I thought she was going to try to fuck him because of the way she leads into it. Oh, yeah. She goes, David. I need you to know what's in my heart. And I was like, this is a weird time to hit on David. <laughs> I am soaking wet, David. All right. Every bed I sleep in is a water bend, David. Just so you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll let you sign those papers. She pulls an absolutely classic fake. She's like, oh, she's leaning in. She's touching him on the shoulder. I want you to know what's in my heart. Jenny's innocent. Also, please ride me right now. Ride me really right now. Jenny's innocent. <laughs> <laughs> so, but and then he's like, but if she didn't kill my wife, then who did? And she's like, it's. Braden has said murder, murder, murder under his breath for the entire first act of the movie, man. Yeah, like, obviously, I'm pretty sure it's it's Braden, the blonde guy that I don't know and have never met in this film. But I'm, <laughs> right, even exactly. I can tell that it's him. Path I have never crossed. It's so obvious other people who haven't seen him know he's the murderer. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so David heads to church to give that a think. So he goes inside the church and apparently this was like a the pastor and the dad had set up like a an intervention with him to to like get him to love Jesus again. I thought I had this down as the stop framing my daughter in law intervention with the pastor. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, and, and they're like you know, hey, look, man, Jenny's not the killer. There's too much movie for that to be the case. Also, you really need to start loving Jesus again because this is a Christian movie and, and, and yeah. we can't resolve it. We can't, we're not even allowed to play the credits until you do. But David's angry. He's like, I've had enough of this scene. I'm leaving. And then we get David and Brayden horseback riding together. Again. All of the fucking, all of the horses in this film. I hated every single shot of horses. And here's, here's a genuinely weird but true fact. I have a horse phobia. I genuinely hate horses. I can, in real life, I'm not bothered about them on screen, but in real life, fuck horses, they're awful. So having to see them ride horses all the time, it's like, Jesus Christ, get over these fucking horses. Horses are shit. And uh, when Marsh wrote that in his notes, podcast listener, I wrote underneath it, knowing how rentable horses are, this is a terrible thing to reveal to me. Like, <laughs> there will be a horse at the next q &A. Oh, we're going to do the next live gam from horseback, right? We're yeah. just gonna, there's just a lot of horses in your future, yeah. Marsh. So, yeah, so David's like, they're, they're out on horseback and David's like, you know, everybody doubts that Jenny killed my wife. And Brayden's like, oh, should I have left more evidence? Or, I mean, should there have been, it would have helped if there was more, damn it, <laughs> can I ride out and come back? And Brayden's like, well, I guess you'd have to be a real asshole to doubt her guilt, huh? With a, with a small penis, you would have to have, <laughs> and, and, and David's like, yeah, I suppose you would. Thanks for being a good friend, Brayden. Your beard is cut normal along your normal jawline. <laughs> that line about the thanks for being, it's like, oh, Brayden, thanks for being the guy who definitely didn't kill my wife. It's real, right. it's real comfort to know you definitely did not kill my wife. Really helps. And now, okay, so then we get another horsing scene 
This oh, time with Jesus David Christ. and his dad. <laughs> Why are they having this conversation? They don't need to have this conversation on a horse. They could be having this conversation any, they could have it in a car. They love being cars. They love to ride <laughs> face in cars. Yep. Have the conversation, have it on a phone while you are both driving to the same location and we can see you <laughs> driving whilst on the phone. Have that instead. Okay, I, I have to point this out because Marsh wrote in his notes in two scenes ago that he is afraid of horses and the movie, as though it heard him, will escalate the amount of <laughs> unnecessary horses throughout the film. So much so that when the cops burst in to arrest Braden at the end, I expected one of them to be a horse. Yeah, yeah. But when, when the credits go up, every one of those uh, those credits is on the back of a horse. Going, yeah, right, Why right, did they right, put his exactly. name on a horse? His name didn't need to be on a horse. It goes up by itself. <laughs> So yeah, but dad tells David, he's like, you know, I know a little something about dead wifing. I've been doing it for a long time right now. Yeah, like, hey, son, come on, it's fine. You're in the dead wife club now. You know, it runs in the family down the male line, like in uh, Teen Wolf. You know, that's how this goes. <laughs> it would run down the female line, but they tend to die. So it has to be down the male line. <laughs> so then, so we watch Brayden pull up at his house. We watch him park for like a while, right? <laughs> Now, like, like he pulls up and then he has to back up a little. He's like, no, I can get a little closer to the curb than that. <laughs> so, and, and he gets out and, and David and him are going to have a conversation. He's like, oh yeah, these are the seven trees that you planted for your wife. They haven't grown at all since that scene no. when you planted them. That's mm. so weird because it's been months now. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and again, this is just such a weird thing. Braden is like, hey, um, apropos of nothing, why don't you sell me this house? You won't even have to change all the pictures because I actually would love the pictures of your dead <laughs> wife that are up. You just um, save you some time. And, and and David rightly is like, wait, don't you have a house? And he's like, yeah, but I didn't murder anyone in that one. I mean, uh, I like your house. It's, yeah, your it's house good. is bad. It's got all these trees, <laughs> these lovely trees. And then Peter the kid wanders over and he's like, hey, David, will you teach me how to play guitar? I mean, this movie can't end without you playing guitar two more times, can it? Uh, uh, <laughs> it's so annoying. And Brayden runs away. Brayden's like, oh, hello, I have to go. <laughs> Kids, right? Always acting like they witnessed you murder someone. <laughs> oh, yeah, Brayden, Brayden's like, uh, anyway, yeah, I've got to go because, uh, you know, my uh, my non-dead wife is sick with my non-dead kid. You know how it yeah. is. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Ooh, right, sorry well, honestly, bad. the way it played in my mind was, oh, you're going to break out that guitar. I got to go. I have to leave now. <laughs> Sensible motivation. Yeah, all makes sense. So yeah, so then, so David like is is guitaring again, right? Like we, we get him sitting by himself playing his favorite three chords. He's playing guitar again. Like if he was playing guitar while on horseback, while arriving somewhere at the start of a scene, it would just be this movie <laughs> in microcosm. <laughs> so, but Peter the Kid shows up and he's like, hey, can you teach me how to play guitar now? And he's like, I sure can. Just watch me play and I won't tell you anything at all about what I'm doing. He's like, that's how learning works. That is how learning guitar works. This kid just walks into his house. Like out of nowhere, this weird kid has got into his house. You know what? That's the kind of lax home security that gets your wife killed, man. Come on. <laughs> sort right. those locks out. <laughs> and he says, oh, apropos of nothing, on the night your wife died, I saw everyone who came in and out of your house. <laughs> And he goes, oh, good, because there's only like eight minutes left in the movie now. <laughs> yeah. And it's only been months since my wife died or yes. something. You didn't want to mention this to anybody? Not even to your curtain-twitching parents who could have told someone? No, right. Yeah, exactly. But he's like, yeah, you know, I saw that lady, Jenny. She came and then she left and your wife waved to her. And he's like, wait, was she dead when she waved or no? And he's like, no, she wasn't. <laughs> And he's like, did you see anybody else come? And he's like, yeah, man, your blonde friend that goes murder, murder, murder all the time. He showed up afterwards. Yeah, I saw the blonde guy enter and he was carrying a gun and a sign that says, I'm here to kill this guy's wife. But you know, I thought nothing <laughs> of it at the time. <laughs> like this exculpatory evidence arriving this late in the case, it's like serial all over again. Like Thomas Smith is going to go crazy on Facebook about how <laughs> Jenny still clearly is a killer. <laughs> it's still clearly Jenny. I don't care what evidence comes out. It's clearly Jenny. <laughs> So he's like, here, go play with this guitar, Peter. I have vengeance to, to carry out. So he goes down to the basement with a sledgehammer, you know, break that floor open or whatever. <laughs> Honestly, if this turned into like a John Wick scene of like him killing his way to Brayden, this I would like I would forgive an awful lot. But he has to kill his way through his family for some reason. <laughs> and a bunch of horses. <laughs> hey, if he's killing his way through a bunch of horses, I'm suddenly back on board. <laughs> there you go. 
So, okay, so we cut over to Brayden's house. His wife is cooking, but she burns herself because she forgets how convection works. <laughs> so fucking dumb. Nice spice rack, though. Both both Marsha and I were like, ooh, spice rack. <laughs> it's a really nice spice rack. It's lovely. It rotates around, but it doesn't rotate around like it feels like it would take any amount of energy to move it, but it feels like it rotates exactly the right amount to where you want to go. It seems very intuitive. I like it. Yeah. Yeah, like perfectly nice. counterweighted. When we started this podcast, we used to talk about people's asses and dicks. And now we're like, <laughs> yeah. ooh, spice rack. Yeah, we've gotten older. Yeah, you used to have a listener who would tell you where like the actress's boobs were on film. Now they're just right. going to send you like where you can buy the spice rack. Yeah, I know, yeah, right. It's available right. To, uh, at this place, yeah. Come on, Jackie. So, <laughs> so yeah, so, so she goes to look for a towel to dry her burn on. No idea. But under the towels in the, in the bathroom... That's where Braden keeps his secret. I killed Jenny stash. Yeah. And let me just stop here for a second to say that whatever comic hyperbole I was going to try to come up with to be a ridiculous I killed Jenny stash, the movie is so much sillier than that. There's, it's a confession note. <laughs> yeah. Right? He's got a confession note. He's got Jacqueline's key necklace, the one that was the key to uh, David's chastity belt. Oh, mm-hmm. I missed yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And he's got pictures of Jacqueline and David with David crossed out in a ludicrous way. It's it's, yes. it's, it's, a, it's an I kill Jacqueline shrine is what he's got here. Really? Yeah. Well, he's going to put it all together in a lovely scrapbook eventually. He just hasn't gotten around. To in the bathroom, it. right there in the main bathroom by the piles of Clearly fancy soaps and hotel miniatures he's stolen. <laughs> right, <looks> yes. <laughs> but right, it's two towels down in the stack, right? It's just like, well, I can't imagine that she'll need two towels on the same day. <laughs> so yeah, so, so but she reads the the note. And meanwhile, Braden comes home. He sees the abandoned pot, right? And he's like, oh, well, this, this has some very like end of the movie vibes going on here. So he heads upstairs to find her. We start hearing like heartbeat noises in the background. We cut to David. He's driving there just as fast as he can. He calls his brother and he's like, hey, I found the real killer and it's not Jenny. And the brother's like, well, that really kind of ruins the finale of the movie. How about I can't hear you? We have a bad connection. He's like, yeah, that's way better. <laughs> way better. Okay. Cool. All right. That that misunderstanding will make sense and keep the tension of the movie going as long as you don't spontaneously know what I said on the phone later in the movie. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, so we cut back to Braden's house. He finds Leslie, his wife, on the floor with all the murder evidence arrayed before her. Like, I feel like she knows what time he gets home would probably not... <laughs> But at any rate, she and she says, how could you be so evil? And he's like, I don't believe in God. Like, duh, I'm an atheist. I'm an atheist. This is super bad. I think this is the first time we found out, the first time I heard his name. I genuinely think this is the first time I heard Braden's name. Because at this point, I heard his name as Raiden. And I thought, oh, wow, he's called Raiden. Did he kill Jacqueline by, like, electrocuting her to death (laughs) until her head explodes? (laughs) Just appeared behind her. It was really weird. Honestly? (laughs) If in the murder scene he had flown across the room at her with both fists outstretched, <laughs> this is my favorite movie. <laughs> no, so yeah, actually, Marsh, I, I knew his name because I checked the IMDb page at a certain point because I, I had to keep writing down karate friend and I wanted to stop doing that. <laughs> yeah, I tried that, but every time I did, Google just told me yeah. 490. It's like, oh, right. Jesus Christ, I know what 70 times 490, <laughs> man. <laughs> But yeah, the first time they mention it is actually like two scenes earlier when the secretary says, well, maybe it was your best friend. And he goes, Braden. That's the first time the name ever appears right. in the movie, I do yep. believe. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so she's like, how could you kill Jacqueline? And he's like, now I might have to kill you too. And she goes, like you killed Jacqueline? And he's like, yeah, well, yeah, I said you just, I said two. Yes, obviously like that. I wanted this conversation to be an infinite circle where he's just like, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, but now I'm going to kill you like Jacqueline. <laughs> I'm so confused. Are you doing like a rabbinical question must answer a question thing? Yeah. Or, or are you doing like the end of Doctor Strange? Whereas if you just keep asking a question and I keep answering in an infinite loop, we're trapped here forever and no yeah, one yeah, dies. Right, Is that what right, you're trying exactly. to do? So yeah, so so we flash back to the, to the night of the murder, right? And we see, and, and nothing happens, right? He just walks into the bathroom and he's like, Hey, Jacqueline, I love you. And she's like, yeah, no, I know we did that at an earlier scene. He's like, now I'm going to shoot you to death. And she's like, oh, don't shoot me to death. (laughs) I will say, if you bring a handgun to your love confession, I don't think you're there for love. (laughs) No, that's fair. (laughs) That's fair. 
So, but then we cut back out of the flashback. We cut over to brother, right? Brother's going like, oh, you know what he said on that static call? I found the real killer and it's not Jenny. That's probably what he was saying. Now, now that I think about it. Sorry, that guy didn't have Mint Mobile, but now I understand because he was on radio <laughs> delay. <laughs> and he's, he's saying this to Jenny. And Jenny seems really relaxed talking about David and what's been going on when David just had Jenny arrested for murder. And she's like, oh, yeah, how is David? How is he doing these days? Is he all right? Yeah, right, right. So, yeah. So but then we cut back to David. He's showing up as I guess Braden is tying Leslie's hands behind her back, as is the prerequisite to murder. <laughs> I guess this murder is going to involve tying you up for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, but so just then David comes in and he says, ah, finally I can confront you. And he's like, no, no, I still have to have one more Jacqueline flashback to sort of like flesh out that My Little Pony thing. Yeah. That was from when we were kids. Yeah. Together. Also, I really wanted them to come out of the flashback and he's just gone. And he's like, shit, he distracted me with the flashback. God damn it. Brady. <laughs> but did, did we see the My Little Pony in the flashback? Because he handed her a flower and I tried to watch it. And I was like, I can't see a My Little Pony there unless the version I was watching was different. Like I got a European cut where they weren't allowed <laughs> to show you like, decapitating My Little Ponies or something. <laughs> no, I don't think that. Like I think we're supposed to think that he messed up her horse and he's apologizing for it. I think, but I think they actually cut the scene where that happened from the fight. Yeah. Which is incredible. Like we see him put my decapitated my little ponies on her gravestone multiple times, and we never actually find out why. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I know what you're thinking, listener. You're like, oh, this is why they've had these two guys doing karate practice together every time we've seen them before. It's so that they can have a big karate fight right here in the. Oh nope, it's over. Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> Here's what I want you to picture for this fight choreography. I put a milk dud in the folds of my tum tum, and without touching me, Marsh is trying to get it. That's the funny choreography of what is going on here. Yeah, just uh, anyone who was there Sunday night QED knows exactly He's what we're yeah, talking exactly. about. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Anyone yeah. who saw drunk Marsh at work knows exactly what I'm yeah. describing. <laughs> So yeah, so so Braden eventually he gets the gun and then David gets the gun back from him and now he's going to shoot him. But then he realizes that he still has to forgive him 489 more fucking times before he's allowed to do that. Well, uh, 488 and a half if you count the unborn baby. <laughs> no, <laughs> I was so sure this movie was going to end with him just being like, all right, Braden, 488 left to go. Brad. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he basically does, right? He says, I forgive you. You killed my wife and my baby, and I still forgive you. And Leslie, the wife, is like, well, I don't. I'm going to strangle your ass. <laughs> it's the yes. best. Yeah, Leslie's my great. hero. She's like, perfect misdirection. Choking me. Making me kiss you in multiple scenes. You look like a model for boys' T-shirts. <laughs> Yeah, but then, but, but David stops her before she can kill him. And then we see the screen blacks out for like a while. And then we get cops arresting Brayden, but, but they're not arresting him lightly like they did with Jenny because he's the actual killer. They're arresting him like a bitchy teenage stepson. They're like, hands behind your back. He's like, you don't want to go. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> <laughs> and then, and, and <laughs> I swear this is how the movie ends. David's sitting in his driveway as he's tending his little saplings or whatever. And Peter, the kid, comes up with the guitar and he's like, Would you like to play one more guitar song for us before this movie's over? And he's like, Okay, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> I guess if you absolutely need that fifth guitar performance, little boy, I can do it. And then again, just to clarify that shooting. Literally, the movie is seconds away from ending, and we hear, like, this is the news. That shooting was also Braden. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah goodbye, right. everybody. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> it's so good. We found out Braden killed her, and months ago, he also hired a hitman to do a drive-by shooting on David, and that was unsuccessful, and that's that thing that you saw that time. Oh, my God. Yes, it was he hired The bad guy hired a hitman to kill David. The hitman shot at him once, missed. It was like, well, I mean, I guess you win some, you lose some. <laughs> you just left and never did anything again. Hey, they call me one try Charlie. I tried once. <laughs> I'm gonna leave. 
if you want persistent, you've got to go up a level in terms of banding for pay grid here. Like you only paid like a couple hundred dollars. This was like a one a one attempt, no further than that. You found me on Fiverr. <laughs> yes. <laughs> The hitman, he hired the hitman, but he didn't pay him. It was just like, look, we'll film the execution, your attempt at execution, and then you can use that in your corporate videos. And then that's, it's a quid pro quo kind of thing like we've been doing with the Airbnb. (laughs) Throw in some Korean barbecue and I'm in. So yeah, no, so I go back and delete best, worst, forgotten gunman from my fucking notes. Have to come up with something else. Don't worry, the movie gave me plenty of options. But this, this totally changes the balance of this film because David was shot at by a hitman and told nobody. Right. And as a result, the person who hired that hitman killed his wife and child. It is David's (gasps) fault. His wife and child are dead. I didn't even think about that, but yeah. I mean, to be fair, that hitman was at 489 forgivenesses. So if that hitman had tried 489 times, you better believe David would have taken him to task. (laughs) So yeah, so we get David back in church now, believing in God like he should. He monologues about the importance of of forgiving. And then they pan up from the grave. He's standing at the grave monologuing to her about how, you know, all right, 487 to go, and then I'm going to kill a motherfucker. And then the camera pans up, and for one brief shining second, it's in focus, right? They happen to (laughs) come across some leaves that are perfectly in focus and then it loses focus and the credits come up. (laughs) So close, so close. And then, and Marsh was kind enough to paste this into the notes in case we escaped the instant the credits started, which we did. It ends on a shot that says, if you would like to invite Jesus Christ into your heart as Lord and Savior, pray this prayer. Mm. Jesus, I know I am a sinner. Please forgive my sins. Wash me with your blood. That's so fucking Weird. gross. Come into my heart. Hot. Even weirder. Even grosser. <laughs> yeah. Baptize me with your spirit. Be my Lord and Savior. I give my life to you. Amen. Oh, fuck. Am I Christian now? Because I read oh, the whole thing. Oh, you see? Yeah. Damn it. Now Noah goes back to his home dimension. <laughs> but what I will point out is... Behind that prayer is a shot of some trees, a field, and a mountain, all out of focus. <laughs> Every <laughs> bit of it out of focus. Yeah. So out of focus. It's real oil painting looking, yep. Yep. All right, so any takers? Anybody want to invite Jesus into their heart uh, while we have him here? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, then I guess that's going to do it for our review of 70 times 7. That's not going to do it for this episode just yet because we still need to tempt you back for some more. So, Eli, tell us what's on deck. When a national tragedy turns into a personal vendetta for aspiring politician Cornelius Barlow, religion comes to the forefront of public debate. A national debate like so many that disguise the real agenda by using words like uniting, inclusion, and coexisting. Wait, that is that the actual description That's of the movie? That's the actual description. Oh my god! Of we'll be watching <laughs> one church. Oh no! Oh, I, I bet the writing's great in that one. Oh. All right. So with that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 378 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to Marsh for helping out today. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to hear more from him. And a perhaps even huger thanks to all the Patreon donors that help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per episode donation to patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing the Alias, Citation Data, D&D Minus, and The Skeptic Crowd, available wherever podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of Andrew Torres, Tim Robson, next year of our social media. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slotnick of Drafts on Mars. All other music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Morgan Clark, and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a check of your life this week. For Healy Land Wright and Eli Bosnick, I'm no illusions. Promise to work hard and earn another check next week. Until then, we'll leave you with a Breakfast Club close. Leslie gave her murder baby to Jenny in one of those two birds, one stone situations. Oh, nice. <laughs> Henry eventually did learn which hole the penis went in. <laughs> the Korean Baptist Church that agreed to sponsor this movie have no idea how good or bad it was because they don't speak English. <laughs> <laughs> they know it's out of focus. <laughs> they, 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 yeah, they, the word for blurry. You playing God of War?
playing the new God of War? I'm not. Oh, you got to play it. Oh, okay. Odin, is, Odin is upsettingly Jewish. He's <laughs> fucking great. So they got Toby from West Wing to play him. Okay. And he's great. He's doing a great performance. Except yeah. everyone in the game, and by that I mean the pixels on the screen are like, he's like, come on, I'm sure we can work something out here. And fucking Kratos <laughs> is like, I, I think it's a no he's a normal amount of funny. Normal. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> God, I have my son here. Just, uh, can you, uh, we were going to have dinner. At one point, they like sit down for a meal and I really wanted Odin to be like, is this kosher? Do you keep a kosher? <laughs> <laughs> the preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights.